sure that this meeting is being streamed publicly and recorded as well. Um, and so given that we are using the virtual platform, we'll do a roll call. Good morning, Commissioner O'Brien. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Hill. Good morning. And good morning, Commissioner Skinner. Good morning, I'm here. Great, okay. thank you. Um, we'll get started with the um, call to order. It's public meeting number 380. Um, and before we turn to the minutes, I just wanna explain first that there have been changes in our agenda today due to unexpected developments. While Dr. Vega and uh, Director Vander Linden were fully prepared to move forward, um, there are some competing factors in the rest of our agenda, which have required us to delay that presentation to a future public meeting. Uh, for that, I, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Vega particularly for his flexibility. And this also means that um, we'll have to be a little bit flexible today as we go through the agenda because we are reordering things as we go along to accommodate the presenters um, for the rest of the meeting. And then second, I really can't proceed um, right now without um, acknowledging my heavy heart and I assume the heavy heart of everyone else <clears throat> as we acknowledge the shocking tragedy that occurred yesterday at the Robb Elementary School in Texas. Um, <clears throat> 19 school children and their teachers lost their lives while a an armed 18 year old barricaded himself in their classroom. And there's no way for me to digest that. And I, I imagine none of us on this, uh, in this meeting today or on the call today. Um, so in thinking about what I might say, I know that we uh, automatically pray for the families that are affected. And we, and we think of the, the loss of life but I did ask um, our chief of people um, and diversity officer, uh, David Muldrew, for some thoughts on this. And he immediately said how important it is for us to remember as state employees that there are significant resources available through our generous EAP program so that if we or our families need help, we should seek those resources. and. Well, I can't really, um, those resources really for our overall health and wellness. And of course that includes our mental health. Um, can't really, um, uh, say to the public what they should be doing, but I am confident that we have so many resources available now to help, um, individuals. And I just will take David Mulcher's good advice and encourage, uh, members of the public to remember that and also to seek those resources when they're troubled. So with that, we'll just continue with um, rec recognizing that yesterday while we were um, managing five suitability hearings and it was an all day process from 10 to five, that tragedy was occurring without really our, not, or really our knowledge. And for that, I'm sorry, um, but today we start off our day with a little bit of a heavy heart, so. We'll get started and um, turn now to um, Secretary Hill with the backing I know of uh, former Secretary O'Brien on the minutes. Yes, bear with me one moment, Madam Chair. We had, do we have minutes? This, we didn't, okay. So I was realizing I didn't read any. I so. <laughs> Um, it's so on the agenda as a placeholder, but I don't believe there were any minutes for today. Yes, there, that's why. Um, and I, there are not. I just wanted to check and make sure I didn't receive anything, um, but we're all set for today. Okay, so we'll look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, um, with that, then we'll turn to um, we'll turn to um, Director Wells and the administrative update. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Uh, for the administrative update, we just have the on-site casino updates by the Gaming Agency Division. I see Bruce Bam there. I, I thought you had mentioned something about Lewis, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah. I thought the meeting was tomorrow. That's why I was going to have Lewis. Oh, okay, gotcha. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, confusing. Uh, my, mine's short today because of the quarterly updates, but I do have two updates. 
Uh, MGM will be starting construction on the new GameSense area on June 20th. Uh, we'll be moving from uh, the current location to uh, the uh, new location, which is uh, the uh, Redenton area, award center. Uh, and uh, Encore, uh, by this weekend, will be moving uh, the poker room from the current 13 tables to 15 tables. So we doing uh adding two more tables and that's kind of it if you have any questions any questions for uh, bruce on that so two more tables at ebh okay okay uh karen do you have anything else for us nothing else for today thank you okay great thank you uh, director wells all right and um <clears throat> As I mentioned, item number four will be um, moved to a future meeting. So at this point in time, if everyone is prepared, uh, uh, Chief uh, Delaney will go forward with your quarterly reports. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. So today uh, we have all of our licensees uh, reporting, um, maybe not all in order. Um, I know we've been moving a few things around this morning, uh, trying to take care of uh, everybody's availability. Uh, but we have up uh, first uh, MGM Springfield with their quarterly report. And um, we have uh, Dan Miller here uh, with us and uh, his team and Arlen Cabarlo and um, Chris Kelly. And I'm not sure who else, Dan, I'll turn it over to you at this point and you can introduce your team. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good morning, commissioners, lady chair. Uh, so, yes, uh, where usually we would have four main speakers, uh, a couple are, are out of the office today uh, you know, on, on PTO that they've obviously very much well deserved. And uh, so you'll get a little bit of the Arlen and Dan show with a sprinkling of Gus thrown in there as well. Um, and so let me just try and uh, share my screen quickly for the presentation. Uh, what's that one there? Are you all seeing that appropriately? Yes. Yeah, Daniel, we can see it. Okay. You might want to, I don't know if you want to enlarge it. There we go. Perfect. There go. All right. Um, and so just, just also kind of uh, finish off this introduction. Uh, we have chosen to uh, update the, the general style and look uh, of our presentation to, to the commission. Uh, one uh, was, was due to flow. We felt that uh, some, some of the time we would jump back and forth from speaker to speaker a little too frequently. Um, and it would be good to, to keep blocks together uh, of similar content. Um, and then also we, we wanted uh, to, to mirror those of our fellow licensees so that uh, you as the commission get a better idea across all three what we're presenting to you. Um, so uh, you'll see that, that change as we go forward. Um, from there, I will hand over to uh, Arlen, who will give us uh, updates on all of our financial related uh, numbers and figures. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Dan. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so reporting on our gaming revenues for the first quarter, um, in January, we generated 18.6 million in gaming revenues <clears throat> and 4.7 in taxes. In February, we generated 19.9 million in gaming revenue and 5 million in taxes. And in March, we generated 24.3 million in gaming revenue and 6 million in taxes, um, ending the quarter uh, with a total of 62.8 million in gaming revenues and 50.7 in uh, taxes. And then we move on to the next slide, we can see that our total gaming revenues quarter over quarter increased about 18%, uh, contributing an additional 2.3 million in tax payments uh, when compared to the same quarter prior year. Um, and if there are no questions, we can move on to our lottery sales. Um, our total lottery sales for the quarter was 311,000, um, an increase of 10% over prior year. Uh, the slight drop we see in January was um, driven by Omicron uh, wave would be our expectation. Um, are there any questions on gaming revenue or lottery? Um, moving on to our diversity spend, um, our MBE spend um, in total um, was, our diversity spend in total was about 9% of our total biddable spend, um, 851,000 uh, for the quarter. Can we just stay on the slide for a second, please?
Thank you. Thank you. And we did see about um, in diversity spend, we did see an increase quarter over quarter from 7% in total to 9%. Um, and on this slide, as you can see, our total Massachusetts uh, spend remains strong with a total of about 46% of our total spend staying within state um, and 27% uh, locally. And then I guess go back to you. Yes, thank you, Arlen. So uh, taking up from my regular compliance slide, uh, and here we'll you know, talk about the, the underage. Um, with the, the first column showing an increase quarter over quarter from, from uh, the end of, of 2021, um, what we're uh, attributing that to is uh, we, as of February 4th, um, allowed access to our South End market by all ages. Um, up until that point, we had uh, cut that area off and pretty much anywhere north of the gaming floor was considered 21 and over. Um, but with, you know, obviously the, the relaxing of restrictions, the, the move forward to return to a, a full service resort, yep. uh, you know, um, that we wanted to open that area up for, for all. Uh, the other thing during the quarter uh, is the amount of family programming that has also increased at our two, uh, you know, ma management properties at both Mass Mutual and Symphony Hall. So we have had a lot more families around the facility that, than previous to that. Um, and, and the final thing I'll, I'll throw there as well is also families staying in our hotel. Um, you know, previously we did not have the hotel full at, at every level, um, but as it has grown and each uh, floor is opened, uh, we obviously are welcoming more guests to that, which include family programming. Um, what I will say conversely to that, I took these numbers, I compared them against both the, the first quarters of 2019 and 2020, and, and these are over 80% less than they were in both those quarters. Um, I didn't compare them against 2021's Q1 uh, because clearly there were a lot of restrictions in place then and we also uh, weren't allowing so many people access to the floor uh, or access to the facility as we are now. Um, moving over one column and, and seeing that there were some gaming in February and March, uh, that's a little bit of a, of a mixed bag sadly where three young gentlemen uh, between the ages eight, 18 and 21 were able to uh, get to a, a table game and play two hands of blackjack. Um, in that particular case, both the dealer and the, uh, the, the floor supervisor that you know, supervised that table were both disciplined for that, for not having checked the ID appropriately. Um, the other three uh, that were, they were slot play, um, they, they were in actual fact involved guardians or parents that helped their uh, underage gain access to the floor um, and then allowed them to either push a button while they were playing, um, or in one case, it was gave a child a dollar to put in a machine. Um, but obviously we, we stopped that, got them off the floor and did the appropriate um, reporting. Uh, clearly, I'm very, very happy that we've continued to see zero amounts of any consumption of alcohol by underage. Um, and then the final column, those that we are preventing uh, at our security-based checkpoints around the floor, uh, or anybody that's presenting us with a, a fraudulent or, or fake ID um, that we run through our system, it comes back and then we, we decline their ability to access. So, any so, questions? Um, I just have a comment. I, I've asked for this in the past. I'm just wondering if you could differentiate between underage and minors when you oh. report to us. You did it okay. in your oral presentation. I appreciate it. That was the question I was going to have, the breakdown of 18 to 21 versus under 18. But if going forward, you guys could mark that um, in the quarterly, make it more um, we'll apparent, it'd be great. Thanks. No problem. Thank you, Commissioner. Daniel, I had a question. Sorry, yes. I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, go great yeah. to see you, Daniel. You too. Um, the the time stacks that you have noted at the bottom. Yes. Uh, is that, so in the gaming area, is that while gaming or which column do those stats correspond to? Is so it just that, in the gaming area generally or while gaming or some combination? Generally, it could include a combination. So, um, so example, the, the, the people uh, that were able to game stayed on the floor longer than those who possibly, you know, literally put a foot on the floor as it were. And so um, when you see those numbers, there, there often appears a bit of a skew. Uh, for giving average time in gaming areas 25 minutes out of all of the number of incidents, so if we added up 13, 20, and 23, clearly mainly they were only on there for maybe one, two, three minutes at a time before our security or, or another employee approached them and managed to get them off the floor. 
it's really when we have a, a singular incident that is longer that it, it skews that average time. Um, to some degree, maybe what we should be using is sort of a median average as opposed to a, a mean average. Um, that, that might be more accurate in this case. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then I will hand it back to the lovely Arlen for our workforce this time. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dan. Um, in reporting our employee numbers uh, for the quarter, we ended with uh, 1,203 employees which is about an increase of about 230 employees compared to the same quarter uh, prior year or 24%. On um, the next slide, we can see the same uh, breakdown just broken out by uh, supervisor and above. Thank you. And it's back to me again. Um, I feel like we're playing a game of tennis here and it's, it's I don't know if it's 15 love to me or 30 love to uh, Ireland. So let's we'll see if I can get a match point. Um, so uh, clearly the commission under, understands our, uh, our loyalty to the Springfield community and the way that we try to uh, you know, help our, our local uh, first responders. So in, in the first quarter, we were able to have two events. Uh, one was inside of our Top Golf uh, suite, Swing Suites, that was attended by uh, local paramedics and uh, EMS uh, responders. Um, and then the second event was actually inside of our tap bowling area. And what I'll just draw your attention to quickly is sort of the, the lower center photograph of those two police officers about to bowl. We, we were all amazed that they could bowl with, with full-size 10-pin bowling balls with their utility belts still on. So that, that was gun and everything, and they, they were bowling like champions. So um, can you imagine what they'd be like if they took those off? Um, and then lastly, um, the, the food pantry, the local pantry that we, we donated some money to and some, some time of volunteers, uh, you may remember when we closed for COVID, we actually donated tons of food to them so they wouldn't uh, go to waste. Um, and then we have continued our relationship with that local pantry throughout out the, the pandemic and will continue clearly with them. Uh, it's a very, very worthy cause. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we're uh, proponents of them helping them out. Uh, and then uh, of course, something that I'm very, very personally proud of is the rollout of Play My Way on, on March 31st. Um, you, you're very aware of what happened that day with, with some of the, the press that went on and that sadly you couldn't make it, but luckily I jumped on in the morning, was able to give you a little bit of a, a running total at the time. Um, and suffice to say, what I wanted to end, end at least this slide with, I did check this morning, uh, we're right at around 1,700 persons uh, who have signed up or enrolled into the Play My Way program since it started. Um, and the other small statistic I want to throw out there uh, is of that so that 1,700 is 99.7% of those who have signed up, period, um, and have continued to stay enrolled in the program. So are clearly seeing some use and some, some benefit from it. Um, I, I think that's a great continued sponsorship of this program that 99% of people are choosing to stay and use it uh, to, to their benefit. So. Um, and then where, where uh, of course, Beth would usually jump in here uh, this relates slightly to those couple of events that we held for our, our local first responders that our tap swing suites and our uh, bowling alley are now open uh, to the public. So uh, where, where they weren't previously, and we've been slowly re uh, reactivating amenities, <clears throat> excuse me, those two areas are now uh, open. Uh, the, uh, the parking garage that is adjacent to the Mass Mutual Center, everything is on track there uh, for a demolition and reconstruction. Uh, I believe the last thing I heard was that uh, that was going to begin in end of July, sorry, end of June, early July. Um, and then we over at MGM Springfield are in talks with the necessary parties because of course our, our parking garage will probably become the main parking garage in the city for a lot of additional persons, um, predominantly our own um, uh, employees over at Mass Mutual Center. And we wanna make sure that we've got availability for them for that. Um, this is where I'm going to hand it to Gus just briefly to give an update on 31 Elm Street that I think is, is quite positive. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you, Dan, for this opportunity to speak a little bit. As you all know, 31 Elm has been an ongoing project in Springfield for a while. There was an issue with um, a, a capital gap that was created, presumably because of the chain, supply chain and inflation uh, costs. Fortunately, the city 
and the state combined to fill that gap. And as a result, um, the, the project is not back on track. Um, wanted to report to the commission that although this is a Q2 event in which we'll you know, speak more about in our next uh, presentation, I did want to advise um, the commission that MGM has funded, fully funded its $16 million commitment to the 31 Elm Street project. That money uh, was uh, issued, funded to Mass Housing last week. And uh, we are hopeful that Mass Housing will then take its, uh, its steps to, to issue those, uh, those funds combined with other sources uh, to the developer to, uh, to get the project uh, fully going. It's already on the way, but uh, now that everything is funded, we were hopeful that uh, we can fast track this project. Thank you. I'll just add briefly that uh, from, from our offices uh, here at 95 State Street, where that building is directly across the street, when we walk in every morning, we look out the window, we can see the construction work that is continuing to occur there now. Um, so it, it's, it's very reassuring to know it's all on the right track and that uh, it's moving forward. So. And then finally, our entertainment offerings. So uh, to the left side of the screen, you can see uh, everything that went on during the first quarter. Um, I could be biased, but I'm a big Queen fan. So the Cooler Queen event uh, that was held up in the ARIA ballroom uh, was very entertaining. One of the big things for uh, Springfield is uh, the Thunderbirds are in the playoffs. Uh, again, that's, that's only very recently. So I guess it's strictly a Q2, uh, but it was due to their play during Q1 that got them there. Um, and and my, I believe it's the first time since they've been the Thunderbirds, uh, even though the you know Springfield has had a local AHL team for many years, um, that they've ever made it to the playoffs. So they're all very, very, very excited. Um, and that's some of that programming I was speaking to earlier. Um, as we move into you know uh, what's coming up next, you can see the, the the different types of events there. I know Lady Chair, you're a John Mulaney fan, um, so you know he's coming to Mass Mutual Center. And and what I'll leave you with um, because it was it was such a boom to us last year that we we could not not reintroduce it is the free music Fridays that we'll be bringing back in the summer throughout. Um, you know, so that, that's going to be a fantastic every Friday open air outdoor. Um, it's just a coming together of the community that uh, we clearly haven't seen in the last few years for obvious reasons. Uh, so let's, let's bring more of that to the city. So I will collapse that down. Are there any, any last questions? I have a quick question, uh, Madam Chair, if that's all right. So now that we're starting to see some openings uh, with the COVID starting to go in the opposite direction of what we've been dealing with over the last couple of years, have you seen any increase in uh, the convention center being used more than it was the last two years? And if so, um, how that's affecting the MGM? Commissioner Hill, uh, yes, uh, we, we definitely have. Um, and, and so forgive me, you're talking about the Mass Mutual Convention Center or ours? I'm talking about, uh, well, both, now that you bring it up. Okay, um, so yes, on, on both counts. I, I think the, I'll start with the Mass Mutual Center. They, they were by far uh, closed the longest uh, out of any of our properties. Um, and so the moment they were able uh, to, to reopen, they had done such a fantastic job of, of asking uh, upcoming groups to uh, delay their visit um, and held on to that business that came back. So uh, we, we didn't have so many cancellations which is true here in our uh, convention center as well. Um, and only yesterday I was talking to our executive director of, of sales uh, for the convention center here at, at, at MGM. Um, and, and she is booking out every single month of groups, trade shows. Um, you know, she's doing everything she can to get that kind of group business back into this facility. So it's, uh, it's on the grow. So would you say that that has grown? Is there a percent in your mind that you could tell us today how much that has grown over the last I, few months? I wouldn't, I'm sorry, I wouldn't like to put a percentage on it. I mean, it, it, it is significant from the perspective of going from none to, to a lot, uh, you know, so it's a zero to a hundred from a speed perspective. Um, but I couldn't tell you month to month how it's grown. That's how I would, you know, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Able to hear me okay. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm having, I can see audio issues are popping up a little bit, so bear with me. <clears throat> um, I just want to thank um, um, MGM for uh, 
addressing 31 Elm today. Thank you, um, Attorney Kim. Um, <clears throat> I know that that really has taken an entire village and I commend Mass Housing for a lot of ingenuity um, a few years ago to get the project going from the state and, and now it sounds like they continued their commitment, which is great news. I don't know if we understood there was a piece missing and unless I missed that last time. Um, Gus or Daniel, but um, it's it's great news to hear that the city and state are seeing the project through and we thank you for your commitment. I know that the, the Gaming Commission um, through the Committee of Mitigation uh, program is thinking about 31L. And so uh, we're delighted that the project continues. And Joe, if you can just make sure to sort of uh, keeping Joe Delaney apprised um, on on, on 31 Elm would be great. I think maybe you've already probably been doing that, Joe, but um, we are very, very interested in that project, understanding what it will mean for the, the benefit of your business and the benefit of Springfield. Very exciting. Okay. And, and uh, we'll keep our Joe apprised as, uh, as we progress. That's great, great news. And the Barrage is also um, another real collaborative effort, right? So. Um, all, all good news for development and good to hear that it's going ahead despite all the challenges. So thank you. Any other questions for MGM at this time? Um, I know that um, we were also asking for an, an update on poker. Yes, Lady Chair. So um, currently our, our poker room is at 14 tables. Um, I might get this wrong now and say three weeks or two weeks ago, we increased uh, the length of time uh, that the, the poker room is open. So previously we were open 11 a.m. to 3 a.m. every day. Now it's 10, so we've got an extra hour in the morning. Um, and so we've seen that increase, that's worked for us. Um, we're gonna you know, monitor the volumes in, in that area um, and continue to see how that grows. Um, no immediate plans to edit, add any further tables than we've got in there, um, but we, we seem to find that uh, the, the number of players that we have meets that net number that we've got right now. Um, we don't have long lines of people waiting to get onto a table. Um, there, there are some waits at times, um, but everything just seems to be at the right numbers for you know tables versus demand at this time. Um, but it's something we're always keeping an eye on to determine if that needs to increase and so on. Um, the other thing that we, we are in the process of um, is the, the section of slot machines that are still in that poker room area um, are being converted to video poker as well, so that uh, it appeals better to those who may have to wait for a table, um, you know, sort of make it a, a round uh, in, environment for them, so. Daniel, can you remind me, is it how many days a week? Is it from 10 to three? All, all days, seven days a week, yes. That's every day now. Yes. Uh, questions for uh, Daniel on poker. I guess I have another question then. Um, I'm always interested in understanding the um, connectivity between the jobs and table games. And so um, I feel those are really good, good, good jobs, right, Daniel? Um, yes. So with the expansion of two tables, how many jobs come with those two tables? Oh, um... With two extra tables since we reopened, um, you're, you're, you're catching me as not being a, a poker uh, person, um, but I, I would, you know, conservatively, yeah, conservatively say maybe half a dozen. Um, if we're looking at the the number of dealers for the shifts, um, and then potentially at least may, maybe one more supervisor in, in that room, um, you know. So th the thing I will say, at least holistically as well is everything we're doing is not hampering our attempts to um, hire. We, we are continuously hiring, so. Right, and so that's, I mean, six jobs is important, mm. right? Um, yes. Six jobs are important. So, and then um, in terms of table games overall, I think our last report, I'm sorry, I don't have those figures in front of me, um, indicated that you're still, a, quite much lower than pre-COVID on games, table games overall. Is that, do we have any statistics on those numbers by chance today? Um, I know that's different from poker, but I just wondered. 
Again, yes. So, um, I can get you. I can get you those numbers. I can send it to to the team. Um, yes, we do expect that our current table game revenue to be lower than it was prior to COVID. Um, we have, and it has to do with how we have um, rearranged the casino floor, um, and you know, moved tables around and added slot machines. And I can get you those specific numbers um, after the call. Right, and it's important for us to keep track of the table uh, table game numbers because, of course, it's all part of the the overall um, mix of amenities that are so important to a Category One property. Um, and, and of course, I'm also thinking of those jobs too, Arlen. So maybe Absolutely. maybe for our next report, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think that would be helpful for at least me and commissioners. I don't know if you want have any follow up questions on table games generally or poker, but and jobs, but that's that's something I I do want to keep track of. And then and then before, um, if you do you have any questions on that? Because I have one more question. Lady Chair, just one more thing to add to that. We are currently in in the midst of a project to move our table games, but regular table games project, because um, they currently open from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily as well, but to go 24 hours. And okay. that will that will increase, uh, one, the availability and two, the positions. So, yeah. yes. Okay, excellent. So, there we go. Um, any other questions? Uh, I guess um, I, I guess I'm wondering, just anecdotally, um, if you can comment on the challenge of, of hiring with respect to food and beverage and how that's impacting your, your numbers are up, which is great on jobs, uh, but I just wonder how, how you're addressing what we understand is really a national issue. It's a sense of last time we spoke three months ago, I know it's a challenge. Uh, so right now, um, one of the things we're doing, we actually have hiring events um, every Tuesday um, focused on food and beverage positions. Uh, we recently were able to reopen Costa, um, which, you know, shows, you know, that our numbers are getting stronger. Uh, Costa, um, we opened up the pizza counter um, on the weekends, Fridays and Saturdays. And we also opened um, the restaurant with the limited menu and the bar, um, also open Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and we're also starting to get ready to um, extend our hours on our counters at uh, Southern Market. So we're seeing some results from the changes we've done. But in terms of um, overall hiring? Correct. I mean, we're able to open those outlets because we've been able to hire them. So having our events, like, you know, we hire every Tuesday, we bring them on site, uh, we interview on the spot, um, and we're able to hire them, do job offers uh, on the spot. And the, the popularity and the volume we're seeing with events like that is what's kind of helping us be able to reopen some of these amenities. So an increase. Okay. Well, thank you for keeping us surprised on that, too. Um, all right, I think those are my questions. Uh, anything else, commissioners? All set? And, uh, Joe, um, I, I guess I'll turn it back to you, but thank you uh, to MGM for its quarterly report today. Thank you for the time. Okay, so um, next up we have Encore uh, Boston Harbor to give us their quarterly report. And we're uh, Joined by Jackie Crum, uh, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, uh, Juliana Catanzariti, and uh, as well as David uh, Darcangelo from the Massachusetts uh, uh, Commissioner of the uh, Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jackie. Well, I'm actually going to turn it over after saying hello to everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Juliana. Good morning, hey, Jackie. Good morning. I am just going to share my screen, hopefully. Is everyone able to see? All set, Julia. Perfect. Um, so Madam Chair, Commissioners, good morning. Uh, we'll begin uh, with an overview of our gaming revenue taxes and lottery sales for the first quarter of 2022. So during Q1, our gross gaming revenue for table games was um, a, 79,459,000. Uh, gross gaming revenue for slots was about $94 million, which resulted in a total gross gaming revenue of about $174 million and about $44 million in state taxes collected. 
So here we have a year over year comparison. Uh, you may remember that during the first quarter of 2021, we were still operating on limited opening hours and also limited gaming positions. So I'm not sure how helpful this comparison is given that Q1 of 2022, thankfully we were um, operating in a, a 24 seven schedule. So our lottery sales for the first quarter totaled about $818,000, which was a 33.4% increase over the same quarter of 2021. But again, this is considering um, the limited operating hours that were in place during that time. And again, here's the um, exact year over year comparison. So moving on to workforce, um, during at the end of the first quarter, we had a total of 300 3,000, I'm sorry, 482 employees. Um, 2,403 of those employees were, were full-time and 1,079 were part-time. Um, of those total numbers, 54% were minorities, 2% veterans, 45% women, and 87% local residents. Um, and that, and there was additional 3% of employees that we don't consider local, but were Massachusetts residents. So 90% of our workforce is Massachusetts residents. Here is our breakdown by supervisory and above employees. Um, so in manager and above positions, 46% of employees were minorities, 44% were women and 6% were veterans. And then in supervisory or above positions, 59% were minorities, 43% women and 5% veterans. So as for our operating spend, so our um, diversity and local figures related to our operating spend for Q1 are all based on a total discretionary spend of $20,324,000. Um, so of that total discretionary spend, 8% was spent with minority business enterprises, 2% with veterans business enterprises, and 14% on women's business enterprises. Um, this is the same broken down by local spend. So more than half of our total discretionary spend was spent with businesses in Massachusetts. And you can see here about three and a half million was spent with Boston businesses, 1.6 with Everett businesses and over a million dollars with Somerville businesses. And that's in addition to those amounts spent in um, Chelsea, Malden and Medford. So, but Juliana, before you move on to the compliance, um, the your women's numbers your employment percentages you're slightly still behind the goal um i know that it's been a bit of a struggle um can you just speak to efforts to try to get that number up to the goal sure Instead of slide eight Sure, I, Juliana, I'll t I can answer that. Uh, so we have we currently have about 200 open positions and we're focusing on those 200 open positions to try to see if we can bring more women in. Um, those, um, so we're reaching out to our local community groups as well. We're also reaching out to some of the trades that we uh, use during construction to see if we can uh, reach those communities. Okay. And what are the, the 200 open positions are mostly? All over, across the board. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of food and beverage still. Um, as the hotel has come back and conventions come back, we have a lot of positions open in, in those areas. So um, hopefully we'll be successful in doing that. We have some uh, positions that are a little bit more flexible in terms of schedule. So um, as we bring those positions back, we're hoping that uh, that will allow some uh, potentially allow some women who have been out due to childcare issues to be able to rejoin the workforce. Okay. Commissioner Brian, you gonna ask your, your question about childcare? <laughs> I don't figure, Jackie usually throws it in anyway, but sure. It, uh, <laughs> is, it, is it available, your childcare center? <laughs> There is there is still availability in the child care center. Uh, the last time I spoke with them, they, they said that they were they were in a little bit of a hiring uh, problem as well. So they needed mm -hmm. to add additional people so that they could open up more spots. So I know they were working on that, but I think that's that's been a trend that we've seen across every industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but your employees continue to avail themselves of it, which is great. They can, yes. There are still available spots. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So moving on to compliance. Um, so before I go through these numbers, we wanted to mention a few recent changes we made to address some of the issues with minors on the gaming floor. Um, so first, uh, as you may know, we've had an issue with the Red 8 dorks because that, so Red 8 is a restaurant um, 
that has an entrance that's not in the gaming floor. So we have that door on the side that we will, security officers will permit minors essentially to go right to red eight and then exit through that door. Um, that's been an issue as of late. So we have posted a security officer outside of that door during hours when red eight is in operation. So if you look at the first column of this chart, for example, in February, um, there were 13 minors intercepted on the gaming floor. Uh, a large majority of those came from that red eight door. Uh, we posted the security person there the first week in March, and you can see the March numbers drastically reduced. Um, so, I mean, out of we, our goal is, of course, always to have zero miles on the gaming floor, but out of approximately 150,000 people each month, um, we're, we're working really hard to, to lower that, but it's, it's, a, it's a massive amount of people coming in and out. So um, the four that we reduced to in March was something we were proud of. Um, additionally, we have... Um, we have as staffing permits, we've instituted a policy where security officers can only be stationed at a casino entrance where a Veridox machine is for about two hours at a time. So that means that a security officer is only sitting there checking IDs for about two hours at once. Um, it's, it can be a monotonous job. We want to make sure there are fresh eyes on all of, um, forms of identification. So that's also helped a little bit, just making sure that we're turning those people over and they're not there for hours at a time checking IDs. Um, the last thing we've done is we also have security supervisors now conducting random checks at the Veridoc stations, just checking in with their people and making sure um, everyone's alert um, on the ball and, um, and paying attention to the IDs that are coming in. So those are three major things that we've done that um, appear to be really helping with the minors on the gaming floor, preventing that from happening. Um, do we have any questions about these numbers? Commissioners? Um, so the only question I have, you have the tally at the very end that gives the under 18. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, any of those, is there a further breakdown in terms of any of those actually intercepted gaming or just on the floor? So I, I think, so there was a, a lot of those instances where parents have accidentally exited right, right eight with very small children, like in babies, in strollers and whatnot. Um, I don't think any of those minors actually games. For the most part, they are literal children with their parents. Okay. And then the, the, you've got the longest time period on the floor being about two hours. Do you know mm -hmm. the circumstances of that one? I do. So that was a 20 year old minor, I believe, who used the valid ID of a family member to access the floor. Um, so it scanned through Veridox. It was a family member. So I presume there may have been some, um, they may have looked alike enough for it not to cause any concern. And then I think he actually attempted to make a transaction at the cage and the cage was suspicious of his identification. Uh -huh. So they um, called over security and I think he admitted that the ID was not his. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So I am going to turn over the next section to Jackie. And Juliana, is this the updated one? I apologize. We had to update our deck at the last minute. Um, is this the updated version? It is. Okay. Yep, this is good. Uh, so as you know, we uh, instituted a uh, process on our ticket redemption units where uh, patrons, if they so choose to donate uh, their remaining change can do so to uh, four different uh, charitable organizations. Uh, it's been really successful. Our patrons seem to uh, seem to appreciate it. You can see uh, the total numbers of tickets that uh, is a, is a very high number. Uh, unfortunately, the dollar number isn't as high as the tickets, obviously, but um, it, it's a well-received donation to these charitable organizations. We do plan on changing out or rotating the organizations uh, as of July 1st. Okay. So uh, under special events, uh, I wanted to introduce you to our Executive Vice President of Operations, Damian O'Riordan. Uh, Damien has been with us, uh, is it about a year now, Damien? Yeah, 10 months, Jackie, believe it or not. It's time flies, you're having fun. Time flies, yes. Um, and uh, I've asked Damien to join us because we had a really special um, honor this, this first quarter and to tell you a little bit about that. Damien? Good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to, uh, very nice to meet you all. Um, as Jackie said, I recently joined the team. I had worked for Ritz Carlton for about 17 years at about six different properties, and I got the amazing opportunity to come and join the Encore Boston Harbour family in, uh, in July. Uh, so it has been an absolutely fantastic experience. I, I think one of the, one of the big things that, that we wanted to focus on 
uh, from an Encore Boston Harbour perspective is always we, we pride ourselves on our service and our, um, our luxury levels of anticipated service. And we were, wanted to achieve our Forbes uh, fifth star for the resort. And that can be a, a big task for any property. Um, it can be especially a big task for larger properties. As you all know, we're 671 rooms. Um, an average Forbes property is a, usually around two to 300 rooms. So uh, we were very fortunate. If about two months ago, we received the wonderful news um, that we were awarded our Forbes five star for the hotel and also for the spa. And that we were awarded a Forbes five star for rare steakhouse, which makes it the highest rated uh, steakhouse in Boston. And um, so we are actually the largest five star gaming resort outside of Las Vegas. And there are only six five-star gaming resorts in North America, the vast majority of them being in Las Vegas. There's one outside in Pennsylvania. And uh, this would also mean that we're the largest Forbes five-star on the East Coast. We are only one of five five-star hotels in Boston uh, and certainly the largest. And our spa is now uh, one of only three five-star um, spas in the city. And um, I, I think, you know, a, a big thing with us going for this, uh, Forbes is very highly coveted, and I'll get on to that in a moment, but um, coming out of the pandemic, this was a huge achievement by the team, and it just goes of the, the focus of the company on really delivering that luxury experience to all of our guests. Um, also, like everyone, staffing was a challenge. Um, I think everybody on the, on the call acknowledges that. Um, and this was our first year going for our Forbes Five Star Award. Normally, it takes a number of years. And as I said, it's usually a smaller property. So the larger the property, the more difficult it is. And then, as you're all aware, we were only open four days a week from a hotel perspective until September. And then we went for seven days. Um, um, and for the team to achieve this has, has really been uh, an absolutely fantastic. Um, so with that, just a little bit of Forbes on the, on the next slide. So if you're not familiar with Forbes, Forbes is the only travel guide and they're the only independent global rating system for luxury hospitality. And they actually rate every single luxury property across the world. There's actually 700,000 hotels and resorts in the world. There are only 323 Forbes five-star properties. And um, there are only uh, just over 100 Forbes five-star spas in the world. And that goes across 74 countries. Uh, so it really is the top luxury hotels and resorts in the world. Uh, we are one of only about 100 properties that has a five-star rating for our hotel and also a five-star rating for our spa, uh, which, which we are very, very proud of. Just to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of insights about what Forbes look for when they when they come to the property, so they actually evaluate over 900 service standards when they come to the resort, and they actually just do one official audit a year. So you get one chance uh, to or earn your Forbes five star award. It's an anonymous visit, so they will come like any other guest. Um, and they will stay with us for a number of nights and they will go through and inspect every single part of, of the resort from a front of house perspective. We have absolutely no idea that they're here. Um, and then what happens is about two weeks later, uh, they will contact us and let us know that they have been here. And then we have to wait for the rating process, which actually happens at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of each year. What, one of the big things is when Forbes, it's all about the service and it's all about the consistency of service. So really when they come, they're coming to inspect what they expect and they're very, very thorough. And while we have an absolutely stunning resort, um, only 25% of the score that they give us is really on the physical facility. The other 75% is all about the luxury service. And I just kind of put up a few classifications that they look at. Cleanliness, cleanliness is, is paramount. Um, so everything from every single part of the resort has to be absolutely spotless. That's the minimum point of, of, um, of entry. Um, but really what it's all about, it's about the food and beverage uh, facilities. It's about the sense of luxury. 
but then it's all about our consistency of service and making sure that the graciousness, thoughtfulness, and sense of personalized service is there. And as, as I said, when they do their inspections, they're anonymous. So we don't know who they are. We don't know if they're just a regular guest. So we could have 400 uh, um, guests check into the resort today. One of them could be the Forbes inspector. We will never know. But really what they're coming to see is what is the typical guest experience? Are we delivering that sense of luxury and that five-star experience to every single guest on every single interaction that we that we have? Um, and so it was a great testament to the team here being in just our first year of going for the Forbes Award and uh, that we were able to accomplish the five-star for the resort, the five-star for the spa, and then four-star for, for rare. Did anybody have any questions for me? No questions from me, but huge congratulations. We had gotten this news a little while ago, but we didn't know really how to digest it, Damien. So this is very exciting. Um, commissioners, I'm sure you join in congratulating um, Encore for this. And I also suspect it was um, in, within the imagination of our prior commissioners when they um, uh, gave the original license. Um, <clears throat> When I arrived and things were underway, that vision was well in place and it's now um, to your credit that it's being acknowledged. So congratulations. Um, commissioners, any questions or, or comments for Damien? No questions from me. I just wanna add my congratulations to the Encore team. Um, very well done. Uh, you must be very proud. And um, I, I think we are too. Thank you. And I must say, I think you should see the lift that it's given to the team, like all of our ladies and gentlemen, just that sense of pride to be one of only 100 resorts in the entire world that has a five star hotel and a five star spa is huge. But I think it's it's just a great testament to the amazing team that we have and just how passionate everybody is about the guest experience. And thank you for acknowledging that. Just to reiterate what Damien said, this belongs to our team members. They worked so hard to achieve this. Uh, we actually did a huge bath of house celebration for them over uh, two different days and we called all the different ships. Um, we laid out a red carpet. We made sure that, that they um, understood that they had earned this award. This was not accomplished by management. This was accomplished by our day-to-day -day, uh, hourly employees. So just to add my congratulations to everyone and um, Damien, welcome. Thank it's you nice so much. Place. I hope I hope you're having a good time. Thank you, Eileen. You've got a good Irish name. I was going to say, and it's nice to see another uh, oh apostrophe show up on the screen. Yes, that, that's for sure. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juliana, if you just want, there we go. Um, so in addition, uh, during the first quarter, we had a, um, an event where we, it was just a team appreciation event. Frankly, we'd found out that we had the Forbes five star and we weren't able to tell people and we wanted to just celebrate them before they even knew it was coming. So we did this a little bit earlier um, and it was, uh, gave out prizes and whatnot uh, for employees. How come we don't get notice of that one? <laughs> the donut wall was really spectacular. My job was to give out the donuts and I had to get trained in food safety to do that. Uh, it was quite complicated. I would have loved to have seen that, Jackie. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Great Jackie, idea. Jackie, great too modest. She did it very well. <laughs> um, also, uh, January was um, National Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and we developed a module. We actually revised our uh, anti-human trafficking policy and developed a module, which we actually started rolling out in December. And it was for all guest facing or front of house uh, employees. And very proud to say that at this current time, we have 99.15% of our employees trained uh, on this module. It was a really impactful video that was put together. Um, and it was uh, launched both here and in Las Vegas. Did you say 91 or 99? 99.15% of employees at EBH have all been trained. Great. So, yeah. Uh, also, uh, 
Problem Gaming Awareness Month, uh, Game Sense was fabulous in terms of handing out prizes and really asking questions and getting our employees engaged uh, once again uh, in uh, problem gaming awareness. So this was a food drive that we did in the first quarter as well. We collected more than 21,000 pounds of food for Bread of Life, uh, which is our local food pantry in the city of Malden. And volunteerism. So uh, obviously during COVID, our volunteer numbers were not where we wanted them, um, but we're really proud to say that as of the first quarter, um, our employees had volunteered over a thousand hours. And I'm even more pleased to say that um, now sitting here in May, our employees this year have uh, volunteered 4,173 hours. Um, we have a goal of 12,000 hours uh, for our employees this year, which amounts to about um, four hours per employee. And uh, another award, we got the uh, Travel and Leisure Global Vision Award uh, honoree. I think uh, this was a um, this was a Wynn Resorts Award. Uh, one of the things they looked at as far as Uncle Watson Harbor was the uh, rooftop solar array and the four megawatt battery. Uh, farm that we have. And uh, David, you're on as well, right? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Nice to see you again. Good um, morning, David. Good morning. Hello, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Great, great to see you. So um, one of the things that we were asked to talk about today was uh, our accommodations that we have at the resort for uh, visually impaired individuals. Um, so we have a number of things. We have a lot of trainings that go on, uh, primarily for um, the guest rooms. At check-in, uh, we have our staff read the hotel policies and procedures uh, to the guests. We also installed in the room have a feature called Room Valet, which uh, features alarms, noise prompts, and shaker pads for guests' uh, beds uh, in the event of an emergency. One of the things that we're currently looking at is uh, to try to integrate that with guest personal device um, so that if they have their phone with them, uh, they, could, they could use that. Um, on the casino floor, um, what our dealers are trained to do is if someone uh, who is visually impaired sits at their table is to actually read through the entire game. So for instance, um, if they're dealing uh, blackjack, they will read to the person exactly what cards are delivered to every single other player as well as uh, the dealer's cards um, and the outcome as well. Uh, the one thing our employees are trained on is to be very careful about touching, touching people's money uh, and making sure that that, that that if they're asked for assistance, that they help, that, that it's all done in front of the camera so that we can uh, try to ensure that there's no issues there. Um, obviously we still have um, gaps. Uh, one of the gaps is uh, slot machines. Uh, you know, David was kind enough to come and visit us at Encore, I think last month. And we were, we were discussing that. Uh, unfortunately, there are, there, it's just not the technology isn't available yet. So we, I did see David. I looked up, and there was one slot machine developed quite a quite a couple of decades ago, but I don't think it ever took hold. And I think part of the problem is there's so many different types of slot machines available, and to just create one slot machine may not be the appropriate way of addressing this. Um, but I was going to say something else. But we looked at different ways of uh, we're trying to be thoughtful in terms of ways that we might be able to mark slot machines um, in order to in order to to allow visually impaired uh, persons to to play those. We did also with the assistance of the IAB, we changed our policy uh, with respect to uh, jackpots. So for instance, um, if somebody is playing with a visually impaired person and they're the one who pushes the button, we would have the discretion to award the jackpot to the uh, visually impaired person rather than our current policy, which is the person who actually pushes the button. So that accommodation was appreciated. Um, David, was there anything I missed? No, I think that's right on. And that reasonable modification definitely satisfies the request that brought us here to begin with. It was one of our consumers. Uh, so I think going forward, it's great. And I'd ask the commission, though, to consider, I mean, you have an operator here that 
And this is going back to my time, just as disclosure, when I was a city councilor in Malden, working on the surrounding community agreement, getting to understand the WIN organization, but also my time on the architectural access board, working on all of the accessibility features for the hotel. This is best in class stuff. So the fact that we're here talking about this problem, maybe we, you know, my pe people would think like, oh, it's a bad thing. This is a great thing because it means that people with disabilities are frequenting the place, which is great news. You know, as, as we were there touring, there's people with mobility disabilities, there's people with hearing disabilities, there's people with visual disabilities. That's a great thing. That's a welcoming environment for people with disabilities. So I think the operator should get a lot of credit here. And what I'd ask the Gaming Commission to consider is, They've done as much as I think they can do reasonably to modify under Title II to modify uh, the, the stuff that they have going on, whether it be games, whether it be the other services they provide. Maybe writing a letter or somehow engaging IGN and some of these other big manufacturers, these third parties that are supplying some of the machines for, the, for these locations, and, and seeing if they can get into a dialogue, come to Massachusetts, we'll show you, we'll, we'll provide groups and you can try to do it because I'd be willing to bet if they could configure a machine to help increase accessibility for people with disabilities, it's probably gonna be a hit machine for everyone. Like it's a good, you know, time has proven that when you make things accessible for people with disabilities, that quickly gets adopted into pop culture and everything else. Automatic door openers, great example. Escalators, great example. Uh, you know, if you want to go back to Alexander Graham Bell, the invention of the phone system and the internet. I mean, he was trying to he was trying to make a device so his deaf wife and mother could communicate, and it you know it turned into the information superhighway that we're on now. But anyways, if we could get into a dialogue with them, take the heat off the operator because the operator can only buy the games that are on the market. David, um, yeah. absolutely, we can take you up on that great suggestion. And I actually would, um, if you wouldn't mind, first off, uh, full disclosure, I've had the, the pleasure of working with David in, in past positions and, and his passion and his advocacy is clear, um, but it's small. Oh, I love that, David, um, but that, but it's smart and, and um, He's in the positions that he's in because he's really good at them and he has great ideas. So commissioners, I think we should uh, take up um, the offer that David's presented. And if David, I can, um, perhaps we could ask you to meet with us um, in some, we do, um, I have convened a working group um, for <clears throat> equity, diversity and inclusion. And this fits right into that. So I think if you would, allow me to have you join one of our meetings would be very much welcome. Oh, that'd be terrific. One thing while you mentioned it, Madam Chair, I did notice that in the DEI thing, disability owned businesses wasn't there. I saw WBEs, MBEs. We have Dobies in Massachusetts. Yes, we sure do. Maybe we could get that spent. And then additionally, I just as disclosure, I am here as my role of commissioner of Mass Commission for the Blind, but I think we could probably leverage uh, the National Council on Disability, as I'm a member of that as well, on this, this is definitely a national issue. Uh, so, you know, any initiatives that you want to put me on, sign me up. Great. Commissioners, I don't hear any argument against that, correct? There we go. Um, and what I also love is that you honored um, Encore with Best in Class, and that's fitting for today's um, presentation and, and the fact that they welcomed your input and implemented it and responded to it. So is, is a testament to that. So Jackie, thank you for this. And, and thank you for the, I didn't know these services would, could be available. I never thought about it. So I learned in this very short, uh, two bullet, you know, I guess there's multiple bullet points, but two sections, I, I learned a lot about um, what the best in class would offer to people who need um, special accessibilities and accommodations. So 
Can Thank I mention you. one other thing? I do want to mention the name of our consumer to put it into the public record here. Thomas Consonetti. He is a frequent visitor there. They know him well. The staff knows him well. He's the one who raised this. And it really does take uh, fortitude on behalf of a person with a disability to bring these issues forward. So I want to definitely give him credit. You had people with disabilities at the table here changing policies. So nothing about us without us is a, is a phrase in the disability community. And that happened here. He was at the table, you know, bringing me in. This is, this is a good thing. So let's be best in class in Massachusetts. Excellent. Great. I, I should also mention that we have uh, recently conducted a full audit of the entire casino uh, accessibility audit. Uh, so we are going to be implementing different, uh, as a result of that audit, we're going to be implementing additional measures uh, to make sure that we are more accessible. Um, one of the primary things that we're going to be doing is updating our websites across the company, Wynn Resorts, not just EBH, uh, but to be, um, to be accessible to visually impaired individuals. Uh, the other thing is uh, automatic door openers are still a really big thing. We want to make sure that we have those installed. So we've just approved a plan to, to do that as well. Great. Any questions for uh, David or for Jackie on this particular slide? It's new to us. I see Commissioner O'Brien. Well, first of all, I love the phrase, nothing about us without us. I mean, it's so on point for things like this. And I think it's great, the involvement that you've had. Uh, and it makes me think we need to have conversations and let the other licensees know um, what you've been doing um, at EBH and, and see, you know, show them the success that you've had so they can communicate with you and take a look themselves. Yeah, we'd be happy to share our policy. We, we've written up a full policy on, um, on accommodations and trainings that um, all of our employees have to go through to, to make sure that we're as accessible as we can be. Excellent. Uh, I can't see everyone, but Commissioner Hill or Commissioner Skinner, do you have any questions for David or, or Jackie? I don't have any questions for David, except a big hello. Uh, blast from the past. We have worked together as well uh, in our past positions. It's nice to see you, Dave. And uh, Dave and Jackie, thank you uh, for <laughs> a job well done. Everyone knows David from, from the past. I first yeah. met David a million years ago when he was with the city of Malden. <laughs> Yeah, well. We go back to the late 1990s, don't we, Dave? <laughs> the legislature. Yeah. A testament to great advocacy and passion and commitment, David. And uh, that smile doesn't hurt either. Um, so, <laughs> all right. My smile is because after this meeting, I'm going on vacation. Where are you going? For a week. Um, don't tell me it's not we're in the public hearing, but that's great. <laughs> I hope you have fun and we'll find out for you later. Um, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm also hoping the smile is a little bit because um, of your appearance here uh, with Encore because you, you've shown some great partnership here. So thank you. Um, and Commissioner Skinner, did you want to close out? I, I did. I just wanted to take the opportunity to say hello to David and uh, Chair Judge Stein, you took the words right out of, out of my mouth. I also wanted to thank uh, David for his advocacy and passion. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, David. And, and I'll follow up um, um, with connecting you directly with us. Um, and, and of course, I know that you've met with um, Director Wells uh, with, with um, Attorney Crum, so uh, she'll stay completely in, in touch with you, but I think we'll and she's on the, the same um, working group. So we'll, we'll right. full circle. Thank you so much. Thanks for the thumbs up. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, happy vacation. Um, Jackie, next slide. Uh, next slide, please, Juliana. Questions? Well, we took care of some. Um, <clears throat> any other questions on the presentation today? Commissioner, I think um, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. I'm sure that you. I think you were aware of the training that was going on on human trafficking, but I, I'm impressed by the fact that it's at the William for all practical purposes 100%. Uh, 
Eileen is going to be working with the Public Safety Committee on this important subject matter as well. So thank you. Um, if we maybe the only question I have, um, Jackie, is I continue to get calls and walking around the streets, I get people coming up to me regarding the poker room. And can you just give us a quick update? I know you've uh, sure. told us in the past you're going to be increasing the tables. Um, I think when you told us how many you were going to be implementing, I was taken a little aback uh, because of what used to be there and what is being proposed to be there. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little worrisome to me and people who had heard you make that remark the last time we talked about this. So could sure. you give us a quick little update on that? Sure, so uh, as you know, we're increasing the tables as of this Friday by an additional two tables. Um, the poker room is currently open Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 8 a.m. We are looking at whether we can expand those hours further and I think uh, that'll go a long way in terms of expanding the offering. Um, the question had been asked of MGM regarding the number of jobs that, that are associated with each table. So I've been told that for each additional table that we add, we add 1.25 dealers, which is not really too, it's, yes. And um, an additional an additional 1.1, 1.125 uh, supervisory level uh, employees. So that's for each table? That's for each, each additional table. Um, I, I think the biggest, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to echo what Daniel said. We are seeing that our lines are diminishing with respect to, um, with respect to getting those tables, we're hoping that we can further do, we can further expand the offering by uh, changing the hours and expanding the hours. Um, but really at the end of the day, it's, it's a matter of real estate. We, we're frankly out of real estate. And uh, any, each table we add will have a substantial impact on the, our revenue as well as the tax revenue that goes back to the uh, Commonwealth. We're happy to, provide further details of that. So help me understand why we're not open on the weekends for this. I, I uh, would think, I'm sorry, I, I would think that we would see an increase in players going on the weekends, but it's not being offered. And I would think business-wise, that's usually when restaurants do the, the best business, I would think it would also be in the case for poker rooms. Um, from what I see up north, and it's, uh, you know, I've taken a little tour of some of the um, New Hampshire places, and that seems to be the bulk of their businesses on the weekends. So I'm a little, again, taken aback that we don't even offer it on the weekends. So I, I think the primary issue that we have with the weekends, which, again, we're going to revisit, and um, is coming out of COVID, um, we saw a lot more people driving to the casino than we previously uh, previously had. So what we're trying to do now is we've just put the boats back in the water. We're trying to increase uh, different modes of arriving here. Uh, but our parking has been almost a capacity every single weekend. So I think that's that's part of the concern is just a parking crunch. Uh, we're hoping as, as people feel more comfortable returning to public transportation that we can relieve that. Thank you. So I, I just to follow up on that, um, that correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, but when you're talking about we're out of real estate, you're not talking about other table games disappearing if you expand poker. You're talking about slot machines disappearing, correct? That's correct. Okay, so just also, and I, and I know you know this, but I think it does bear stating that in addition to tax revenue, we also are concerned about job and the resort experience. And so it's not simply maximizing the slots revenue and, and, and you know, total gain Absolutely revenue. understood. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. The same way that you're balancing it. And, and it, while I can appreciate that the parking is a bit of an issue, it, it also seems to be, again, a, you know, a profit choice of saying that you're going to try to get the parking in for the people that go to slots and turn over more than the poker players who, it's my understanding, stick around longer. But again, you know, to Commissioner Hill's point, that's tax dollars traveling outside the Commonwealth also going up north um, that probably would stay in the Commonwealth if the tables were available. So you, you say you're reevaluating it. I know you know all these things, but I do think it bears repeating. Understood. And, you know, I think um, having the flexibility to make these changes is really important for us too. When we started, our slot offerings were, in fact, I'd be surprised if there's uh, 
a handful of slot machines on the floor that are the same as when we began. Um, the slot machines have changed dramatically. Uh, we were, you know, before we had rows, we changed that uh, configuration during COVID. We went with bigger uh, machines that are more, um, that have more separation between them. So I think uh, the entire floor has changed. We're constantly reassessing to see where that pressure is. Uh, we have people complaining to us that we don't have certain slot machines that they liked from before. So I think there's always, um, there's always that balance and we, we do take it into consideration, of course. Other questions for Jackie on the poker update? I have um, one question that's unrelated to today's report. Um, and Joe, if you could chime in here on details, but I'm wondering if you could update us on the impact of the um, closure that's occurred over at Sullivan Square, um, the, the impact on your employees and of course on, on business, if any. Um, would be more than happy to. Uh, obviously it's a huge, huge uh, traffic concern. Uh, the traffic's been backed up every single day, uh, as, as you're probably aware, all the, back, all the way back. Um, no, actually, I'm not, I'm, and I'm not oh. sure. But maybe it, we might want to set the stage a little bit more. Sure. In, detail in terms of what happened? <laughs> to what it is and what the, the plan sure. is. And I know Joe has the details. I have enough details, but I, I really think we want to put it out. Um, yeah, really with, uh, Madam Chair, would you like me to just run through sort of what, what has happened? Sure, that'd be helpful, Joe, and then Jack can chime in. So the, um, the, the city of Boston has, has closed the underpass underneath Sullivan Square uh, for a period, as I understand, for about six weeks so that they can do a full evaluation of the condition of that underpass. If you've ever driven it, it is uh, in bad condition in, in a lot of places with concrete falling off and so on. Um, but uh, so the intent is to close that for six weeks then reopen it. Uh, do some design work and do some repairs on on that uh, later, uh, later in the summer, perhaps into the fall. Um, as and that's as I, I understand it today. I haven't. I had uh, just one conversation with the city of Boston about this, and uh, um, that's my understanding as it stands today. So, with that setting on the stage, Jackie. <laughs> so, um, and Joe, you can correct me on the number, but. I was told that approximately 60% of the traffic that goes through Sullivan Square actually utilizes the, those tunnels. So people who are commuting from uh, the northern suburbs will come in that way and shoot right through under the tunnels without uh, going through uh, Charlestown. But um, it's caused significant backups from anyone for our employees and guests who are coming from the north. Um, Principally, I'd say the north, uh, although it's closed uh, coming in from the south as well. Um, the backups in the morning, and Juliana could probably speak better to this because she's she sits in that commute. It's do, how long has it been taking you? I think before this, it was maybe twenty minutes, and now it's regularly forty-five to an hour. So, so our employees are definitely feeling that they're they've asked us, you know, what. What can we do? How can we stop it? Um, we understand the city of Boston's doing uh, doing this analysis. Uh, we're working with the city of Everett as well, because uh, obviously it has a, a giant impact on Everett. Have you heard anything from patrons? Um, we have not. So um, I think for the most part, our patrons tend to come at um, not the same hours that the morning commute is going on. So. Uh, people have adjusted as well. They're, they're going round. They're, they're coming from the south instead of uh, coming from the north. But uh, the, the biggest issue is that morning commute and, um, and our employees. Questions, Commissioner, on that matter? Joe, anything you want to follow up on on that? No, we're, you know, we're monitoring it. Um, I think, and you know, it, I, I think it's, you know, the, the city, the city has done this. It's their road uh, to do that. But I think if, if if it's having a negative impact on, on you know, visitation to the casino and obviously revenues to the Commonwealth, then then our we certainly be concerned about that. So you'll if stay, that, you and Jackie will stay in touch on this 
Um, the only other thing is, excuse me, <laughs> um, on communication plan, I know um, you had to react quickly, but I haven't gone on your website. Excuse me for that, but if you, you probably have been notifying patrons of, if they're figuring out how to go around, either they learned the first time or they notified them. Um, I, when I spoke to our transportation manager, he said they were notifying patrons. I'm not sure where it is, but he did say that they were having communications with patrons regarding the the, 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 the time frame and everything for closure. Okay, well, thank you for that update. Anything else? Um, Madam Chair, I just, I just wanted to ask Jackie if, if you could um, just give us a quick update on the, the development across the street. I know we have some things that are due back to the commission uh, in the not too distant future. Yes, and we are working on the deliverables. Uh, where it is right now is we've submitted a letter to MEPA and uh, MEPA is um, evaluating that. So um, as soon as we have a response from them, we'll be able to proceed accordingly. But uh, we are we're continuing to work on the design, taking into consideration um, the, uh, the requests that you had and um, I think we have until June. Is that right, Joe? To yeah, I think, the, I think the uh, March 14th, I believe, was the date that that was approved. So we we gave you 90 days. So it'd be middle middle of June. Right. So we'll we'll have those in time. Great. Okay. And that, that was all that that was all that I had, uh, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, um, Chief Delaney, and thank you, Councillor Crum um, and uh, Juliana. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation today. We appreciate it. And I see that uh, uh, David is still on. Um, again, we thank you for, for your contributions today. Commissioners, are we all set? All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> moving forward then on the agenda, um, <clears throat> next, we anticipated um, at this time we'd be having our lunch break. I offer a short break, unless you wanna go, we're gonna go next right into community mitigation, which is item um, item 5B. And then um, Plainridge Park is presenting a little bit later just because of their schedule. After community mitigation, um, I think I've got this right. Crystal will go to um, the legal divisions piece and then finish up with PPC. So do we need a short break now? Or should we go, uh, go right into community mitigation? Yeah, if I could have five minutes, that would be great. Okay, we'll do a five minute break um, and that gets you ready. Joe, um, Chief Delaney, will you be all set for that? I am ready to go. Okay, <laughs> and, and I know your team is ready too, Mary and Lily. Thank you so much. Thanks. We'll be back in uh, five minutes, 1130, thank you.
Hi, Dave. If you can take uh, down the screen, we'll see who's here. All set. Thank you so much. There we go. All right, so we are re reconvening on May 25th, public meeting number 380. A reminder, this is being streamed, recorded, and we'll do a roll call. Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Commissioner Hill. I'm here. Commissioner Skinner. I'm here. Great, thank you. We'll get started. We are, um, as I mentioned, we're going a little bit out of order on our agenda. Um, we have skipped down to item 5D, our community mitigation on applications. Again, thank you, Chief Delaney. Big day for you today. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner. So uh, welcome to, I guess this is round four of community mitigation fund applications. Um, it's, um, this year, it does feel a little bit like a, a heavyweight fight with the number of applications that we have. So, uh, so today we are um, taking up the community planning applications and uh, in the interest of trying to keep a kind of a relatively even workload, we pulled a couple of our specific impact and public safety applications forward into this meeting so we don't jam things up too much in June. Um, and I guess before we get into the particulars of each application, um, the one thing I'd like you to remember with the community planning applications is that in our guidelines last year, we did make some modifications uh, to the community planning category where the commission made the determination that there are certain impacts on the local communities, specifically in areas such as uh, restaurants, retail, entertainment, things of that nature. And in doing so, um, it relieved the burden of our applicants from having to do a detailed analysis and trying to quantify um, the impacts that, are, that, that the casino uh, is causing. So th that's sort of reflective in, in many of our applications this year where uh, perhaps in previous years, we would have asked a community to do a lot more work in that area. They have not had to do that. So we think it's made it a little bit easier for our applicants while also uh, realizing that we, we do know that there are certain impacts that take place. So with that said, I'll jump right in. Um, I think as we did in the previous rounds, um, We'll go through each particular application and then open it up for questions and then uh, do uh, votes at the end. Um, so the first application we have is the city of Everett. And this is uh, for the development of some guidelines, design guidelines in their industrial district. Um, they are requesting $100,000 uh, for this work. Uh, so the review team is recommending that we award the full amount of 100,000 uh, to the city of Everett uh, for this. Now the impact that they have identified um, associated with Encore Boston Harbor is really the fact that the development taking place in the lower Broadway area and Encore also purchasing additional land in the neighborhood um, and, uh, and developing that has put additional pressures on other properties in the area. And there's been a lot of uh, properties that have uh, been up for sale that have uh, changed hands and that are looking to be redeveloped. And essentially what we had before Encore was a pretty static neighborhood where not a whole lot had been changing over the years. And um, the building of Encore is really putting development pressures on this neighborhood. And the city really wants to try to get out ahead of that development rather than responding to it, trying to come up with some plans that would uh, that would improve that area. And we did give them a grant a couple of years ago to look at their designated port area, which is adjacent to what they're now calling the entertainment district, the Lower Broadway Entertainment District. Um, and this effort really expands on that to look at the rest of the industrial district down there. Um, you know, the idea is they're looking to refine their, their zoning policies and develop guidelines that will allow a mix of industrial and mixed use development that will complement the, uh, the development that's going on uh, on Broadway now and not just reacting to, um, 
sort of unfettered development uh, by just sort of allowing things to happen as they might otherwise. So the review team really likes this proposal, uh, thinks it's a, it's a good use for funds down here and, and will certainly, uh, we, we hope, complement uh, the development that Encore is doing and help the community uh, guide development in the area better. So with that, I will open that one up for any questions. Looks like everyone's all set, Chad. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so the next one is uh, Foxborough, Plainville, and Rentham, uh, a regional destination marketing plan. Um, this is a joint application, which is something that we always try to encourage. We, we like to see regional approaches to things. Um, so the review team is recommending awarding this uh, grant in the amount of $136,000 to the three communities uh, to develop uh, this regional marketing initiative. Um, just a little background, we did give uh, the three communities an earlier grant. Uh, it was actually using all of Foxborough's money, uh, but it was also to assist the other communities um, in starting the development of a marketing plan uh, for particularly looking at the regional draws in that area. Of course, Foxborough has Gillette Stadium and Patriot Place. Rentham has the Rentham Outlets and uh, Plainville, of course, has Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, so the earlier efforts started the development of a website and so on, and this um, would further develop that effort. Um, they're looking to do some professional photography and videos and so on, and, and um, the continued development of a marketing plan for the region. Um, and again, we really like this application. Uh, you know, they include not only the, the town of Plainville, but Plain Ridge Park Casino itself. So clearly a connection to the casino. This is really uh, an example of someone who's looking to, or a group of communities that are looking to take advantage of the presence of the casino to leverage that presence uh, and, the, and the visitation that it gets to also bring those to the other communities. And also again, taking the, the people who are coming to Patriot Place or Rentham and encouraging them to also perhaps uh, visit the casino as well. So uh, really nice uh, um, uh, proposal to try to uh, encourage additional visitation to the area that will help not only the communities, but potentially the casino itself. So again, we recommend this grant uh, and uh, be happy to answer any questions on this one. Questions on this? I'll, I'll set again. Okay. Um, the next application is the, the city of Lynn, um, a marketing campaign. Uh, the, the city has actually withdrawn this application from consideration. Um, and I'll just give you a quick explanation of what, what had happened that, that precipitated that. Um, so back in 2021, we awarded Lynn a grant to start the development of a marketing program. And, and that included a few different pieces. The first piece was the development of a, uh, a video, which they have done. Um, the second piece was hiring a marketing professional to help the community uh, develop a, a marketing plan. And then the third piece of it was to do some um, advertising buys, be it uh, billboards or uh, uh, you know online or all, various types of uh, advertising. So when phase two came along to develop the marketing program, Lynn developed a request for uh, proposals and, and sent that out and got no applicants. Um, you know, so there were no takers for that, uh, which was a little bit uh, concerning, uh, but the city's gonna give it another try. They're gonna try to do a, a little better outreach to firms to see if there's other folks that might be available to do this. And then if that is not successful, um, they may actually come back to us and try to revise that proposal a little bit to possibly do some of the work in house. <laughs> They've uh, recently uh, hired some additional planning staff and they do think they might be able to do that, but, but obviously that would require uh, a revised scope of work and some additional work on, on, the, on the part of the commission. So, <clears throat> Given that uncertainty, the city felt that it was a little bit premature to be requesting additional money. So they have withdrawn that application. Um, and if they are successful finally in, in, in advancing the 2021 grant, they would probably be looking to come back in maybe next year to, uh, to apply for some additional funds. 
So I will open that one up for any questions. We're all set, thank okay, you. Okay, not appearing. Um, so the next application is uh, Malden, the city of Malden. Um, they are requesting $100,000 to perform a study to convert the former Malden District Courthouse into the Malden Center for Arts and Culture. Um, you may recall that this was in front of the commission last year, uh, the same request. And uh, the commission denied this last year primarily, well, really for two reasons. One is that the city had not taken ownership of the property as of, as of that point in time, but also under our old guidelines, the communities did have to uh, do some significant additional work to try to make connections to the casino. And we weren't really comfortable with the connections that, that they made last year. Um, they did a better job of it this year, but also again, our revised guidelines uh, make that job a little bit easier for them. So we felt satisfied that, that the connection to the casino was, was satisfactory uh, this year. Now, the other piece is this, the city still does not own uh, the property, but they have filed a bill um, to do that. And uh, you know, Commissioner Hill has done some outreach to his uh, former colleagues, uh, at, at, on, uh, on Beacon Hill to, to, to discuss the, um, the status of the bill. And, and um, it seems like that will move forward uh, this legislative session and, and should be completed before the, uh, the uh, legislature adjourns at the end of July. So what we are recommending here, we are recommending awarding the full amount of this grant uh, for the $100,000 but we are asking that a uh, condition be placed on this, that we wouldn't um, actually finalize the grant documents with the city until they have taken possession of the property. So what we would do is if the commission agrees to this, um, we, would, we would draft up our grant documents so on, and so on, but we would just hold those in abeyance until we got um, some confirmation that, that the bill has passed and that the, uh, you know, the property is in the process of being transferred to the city. Um, so I know that one's a little bit complicated. So I will uh, open that one up for any questions. Um, I, I just had a question and maybe Brad, you can answer it more than, uh, than Joe. I know Commissioner Skinner and I were wondering about the statute and the verbiage, whether it was a shall versus a may. Um, it, and it looks like it's decab may transfer and then the rest of it basically focuses on what Malden would do and restrictions and then allows them to further sell as long as they have the same kind of restrictions. Um, the status of it now, maybe you can just yep. fill me in a little bit more about sort of why you're optimistic that this is something that's going to happen in the near future. And then another question, which Brad, you may or may not know, which is whether or not there've been any other parties interested in this. It looks like the property belongs, it is in the name of, um, the court, the trial court. And we've going from that subdivision out through DCAM to Malden. So I don't have an answer for your second part of the question. The first part of the question is that the bill uh, was moved out of committee and went to Ways and Means. And they're going, we made a phone call to the sponsor of the bill who had had conversations with the chair of Ways and Means. And it looks as though they're going to be dealing with all of these local bills, hopefully in the first week of June or second week of June. So he, I'm going by the word of two legislators who have talked to each other. Um, that the bill will be done relatively soon. Okay, so it's ripe for them to say yay or nay. Yeah. Jim. So, so we'll go through the House first. Um, I believe this is uh, an Article 97, so it has to have a roll call by mm -hmm. the legislature and has to pass by... Uh, Two-thirds? Two-thirds vote. Yeah. Um, and then it will go to the Senate for the same process, but it should be done by um, July 31st for sure, according okay. to uh, the sponsor of the bill. And, and the other thing is, I think our thought on this was that, um, you know, even though that the, the city doesn't own the property today, that to delay it would, would, it would make them have to come in back in next year. And when we have feel pretty good confidence that it will move ahead this year, we thought that the delay, you know, would have been kind of excessive. Um, so that's why we were recommending it for this year. I think we're putting language in that we wouldn't give the money until the ownership uh, took place. And, and we'd be comfortable with um, Chief Delaney's um, 
level of comfort on that, um, whatever it is. Um, you know, well, I think we just have the first, you know, once the city takes title. I mean, yeah. right? Yep. I think that's I think that's fine. And and you know, and the issue is if they didn't take title, we could just never award this. So I mean, it's it's it, you know. Right. And then, and the funds would the funds would revert back. Yeah, I mean, I think if you know, if never it, go out. If it was determined that this property went to someone else uh, for whatever reason, or or the bill didn't or, pass or whatever, um, or the mall and then sold it out to another party. That's the only thing I want to make sure our verbiage is: is they could take title and then spin it out um, to another not-for-profit, consistent with the same ideas, but it wouldn't have to be the city. Um, so I just as long as our language not only conveys that, but that this is for the city's use. Yeah, but I'm not sure if the fact that it goes to a nonprofit, I know we have the anti-aid issue, but there's case law that suggests if it's still really consistent with the public use. Except I, I guess where I'm coming from as a vote on this is it's one thing for the city to come in and ask for the funds for their purposes to do this, that I'm okay with. I'm talking about if this ultimately, for whatever reason, stalls and at the end of the day isn't Malden, but some other party, that might change my desire to vote for the funds. I see, uh, as opposed to it being a legal, um, the legal construct isn't necessarily. Yeah, I'm not talking about anti aid amendment so much as conceptually um, who's really? coming asking us for the money. Yeah. So, we, you know, Joe's kind of nodding his head. I mean, I think you get where I'm coming from in terms of the wording I'd want in the. But in it's, the so it's to perform a study to convert the former Malden District Courthouse into the Malden Center for Arts and culture. Um, so I think, you know, I, our notion on this was that we didn't want to just give out the money without knowing that the city was actually going to get this, you know, to do a, a, a $100,000 study for something that could never come to fruition, we felt would be, you know, maybe an improper spending of funds. So we wanted to make sure that, that the city owns the property, then they can study it. And if, you know, if they determined that they wanted to either hire a company to run this heart center or whatever. I mean, look, there's, there's many other uh, things that would have to be done to this property before it could be converted into an art center. This is just simply a study of the property itself. You know, we, we could have okayed this without them owning the property, but again, that, that just felt like it was, you know, putting yeah, the cart before the board. I mean, we rejected that last year, so I am just right. remembering and where we were, all, were on this last yeah. year. I, so the fact that it's a study and that they're closer to owning it, um, I guess I understand, Commissioner Brown, your point that you'd wonder what was happening down the road, but given that it's a study. Um, as long as it's executed by the city, then yeah. 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 Oh, the study would need to be executed by the city. I mean, it, it is a grant to the city itself. They, they, I don't believe they could then assign these funds to someone else. Right. That's, yeah, that's my, yeah. And, and I my assume that, scenario, that was what I was just wondering about. So, yeah. And that would apply to all of our grants, correct? Sure. And yeah. Okay. So at this stage, a study feels, um, feels appropriate with the condition of, of still ownership, I think, right, Commissioner O'Brien? Right. Okay. Commissioner Skinner, do you have questions on this? No, um, Commissioner O'Brien's questions and the discussion uh, covered it for me, but I do want to just clarify um, that <clears throat> the uh, grant contract would not be executed, correct? Until, unless and until Malden established ownership or control over that. Yeah, that's correct. The, the the idea here is we would, you know, we would go through our, we would develop our contract and our grant like we like we do, but we would just, we just would not send that out for signature, or we wouldn't, we, you know, we wouldn't sign it until such time as we've gotten those assurances. So based on that, and again, um, the earlier discussion, I'm okay with with moving forward on this one. You know, and I think we'll we'll need to talk with with Todd and and his folks and Carrie just on what you know we would we would need to get from the community that would sort of satisfy that requirement. All right, so the next one is uh, 
city of Medford, um, what they're calling the Wellington Transformation Study. So they are requesting $100,000 to complete a planning study for the revitalization of the Wellington area in uh, Medford, uh, wanting to look at land use, redevelopment, urban design, infrastructure, and so on. Um, we are recommending uh, the funding of this uh, study. So what they are looking at, they're looking primarily at the Wellington uh, T station area, as well as the old or what's the current uh, Meadow Glen Mall area. Um, so these are all areas along Route 16, which is um, a one of the major routes uh, to the casino, from, particularly from the north. Um, so there's a lot of traffic that goes by these areas. And again, this is as a, a community planning study. Again, they, they don't need to do a whole lot of hard work to say, you know, what the impact of the casino is. Um, but, but this is trying to do two things. One is they're looking to do some redevelopment in that area, particularly transit-oriented development, mixed-use development that can um, attract some new investment to the area. But the thought is, is that, you know, the, the properties as they exist today are not a particular draw for people who might just be passing by going to the casino, but having more mixed uses where there might be uh, restaurants and other entertainment and uh, uh, residential and other uh, things that there might be a, a better draw for uh, potential uh, patrons and employees of the casino, um, but also to, uh, to mitigate any of those negative impacts, those things that we have determined uh, things like impacts on restaurants and retail and entertainment that that, that area might be uh, might be seeing. So again, um, you know they're they're going to hire a consultant with these funds to to do this study. Then they want to look at the zoning and land use and infrastructure and access um, again to mitigate negative impacts as well as take advantage of new uh, economic opportunities that would be derived uh, from Encore. So again, we are. Uh, we're, we're recommending this one. So I'll open that one up to um, any comments. Right. Not appearing. Um, so the next one is uh, Northampton, uh, continuation of their, uh, the development of their Northampton Live website. Um, so we are recommending awarding the full amount of this. They are uh, requesting $75,000. Uh, but we are also recommending um, that as part of this grant um, that uh, the commission require the city to develop and provide to the commission a plan um, that outlines how Northampton will uh, transition this website into a self-sustaining platform. And we are asking that that be submitted with their first quarter report after the uh, uh, project is awarded. Um, and just a little bit of background on this one. Uh, the commission has awarded grants uh, to Northampton uh, in the past. Uh, we, get, we gave them a reserve grant initially, and then we issued them additional grants in 2020 and 2021 for further development of this uh, platform, this uh, website. Now, um, in 2020, um, we did reduce the amount of their request uh, because a portion of that money was being proposed to be used for sort of day-to-day -day operations of the, of the website. And you know, under the community planning category, um, you know, sort of day-to-day -day operations aren't really uh, uh, considered as part of that. So um, we did reduce that application. And then of course, that was being approved while the pandemic was uh, just hitting us and in full force, uh, you know, we, you know, obviously couldn't predict what the future was going to hold. So through 2020, um, you know, Northampton uh, and their businesses were having a difficult time like, uh, like they were in many other places. And partially because of that, um, you know, the, the city had some ideas on how they were gonna try to raise local funds to help support this. And, uh, you know, the difficulty of asking uh, businesses for funds when they are really just trying to survive was, uh, was difficult, if not impossible. So um, Northampton again requested money for 2021, which we approved. Um, and, you know, we were not really envisioning uh, 
funding this platform beyond 2021. But again, no one could really predict, you know, how deep and severe the uh, the pandemic would be. Um, so again, like I said, the review team was a little reluctant to to recommend this initially, but we did talk with the community. You know, we sent them a, a request for supplemental information, and then we had a conversation with them, and. Uh, you know, got a couple of assurances. First, you know, again, we needed to ensure that this was really for development of the platform and not just for operational costs. And then secondly, um, you know, we talked with them again about this notion of making this uh, a self-sustaining type of application. Um, you know, the review team uh, doesn't really believe that, 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 you know, community mitigation funds should be used uh, to, uh, to fund a, a program, you know, forever. It's it, that, you know, on things like this, if it's truly gonna be successful, it should be something that the community is behind, that their businesses are behind, and that, you know, they have the ability to, to keep this operational uh, without, without subsidies, you know, sort of in perpetuity. Um, in the end, we do recommend that this be done, but the other thing we are asking is that this be conditioned, uh, not, as a condition of awarding the grant, but as part of this grant year, uh, asking the community to provide us with um, with a written plan on on what efforts they are going to take during this year uh, to make this self sustaining and uh, you know uh, and to do that uh, going forward. And I just wanted to say this raises a, a bigger policy question. I think for the commission that we'll we'll want to discuss more. I think after today of, you know, where should this program be going? I mean, should we be uh, limiting funds to communities? Uh, should we be funding things long-term? Should we not be funding things long-term? And I think these are questions that the commission will need to, need to answer, uh, I think probably before our next round of funding, but I just wanted to sort of, I don't think we need to discuss that today, but sort of just want to tee that up as a, a you know, a future, uh, topic of discussion. And with that, um, I will open this one up for questions. Questions. I, I have maybe a comment rather than a question. I'm pleased that the, the um, working group decided to move ahead on this, um, mainly because our community guidelines did shift um, a bit that can help on community planning really make sure that opportunity costs aren't lost, right? Um, I'd love it um, if maybe Mary and, and Lily work with you, uh, Joe, um, as, as you do your outreach for um, Northampton to maybe, I, I don't know about the opportunity, I'm just surmising that there might be an opportunity for them to do something in conjunction with the appropriate neighboring communities like similar on marketing efforts like what Foxborough, Plainville, and Redland have done. Um, I know that there's a, a, maybe a, a wider spread of you know, geology, ge geography there, I'm sorry, and that it's a little bit further from the casino than certainly in Plainville in those surrounding communities. But I just wonder if um, there's an opportunity for them to collaborate with other um, communities and, and, and perhaps submit something that will have bigger impact. I feel like their website was an attempt to, to do that. And I, I maybe, I'm, I'm happy you've confirmed that they're not using the funds for operational purposes, but I just wonder if that might be something down the road. Again, I know you probably are gonna do your brown bag training sessions and perhaps this uh, if, if we are assuming that we approve the Foxborough, Plainville, Rentham um, collaboration, that might be a model for them to use. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we always encourage, you know, sort of regionalization. We give some bonuses for doing that. Uh, you know, the, you know, you can lead a horse to water. Uh, I understand. <laughs> um, and, and maybe... I'll repeat this more eloquently down the road as we close out these, but I do love the collaboration that we saw um, in the earlier you know, marketing because it really is to, to leverage opportunities that the casino bring for the region. So thanks. And thanks for um, 
sticking with Northampton. Next. Okay, uh, no other questions on that. So the next one is um, Revere. Um, they have called it their Broadway uh, placemaking and branding a program. So they are asking for $100,000 to look at opportunities, to analyze opportunities and develop best practices to establish Broadway as a full service and viable commercial destination for residents and visitors. Um, so a couple of things that they're doing, um, they're looking to try to uh, do some branding of the district identity. This is their central business district and their central shopping area. Um, they're trying to improve uh, the public realm through uh, wayfinding and some you know, branding signage, and also to develop some cross-marketing campaigns as part of this. And again, the review team is recommending uh, the funding for this, this program. Um, so again, the, the city really is trying to, uh, you know, to do two things, trying to mitigate some negative impacts of the casinos, but also doing some of that outreach to try to take advantage of the presence of the casino there. Um, in Revere, we did give them some money uh, a couple of years ago to develop a, a tourism video, which they are just finishing up and they're looking to try to use that in conjunction with their marketing uh, plan that they're putting out to help maybe attract some of the casino patrons or employees to the Broadway area. Um, you know, again, some of the wayfinding signage, um, you know, there's a lot of casino related traffic that uses Route 16 passing through Revere. And, you know, they're trying to uh, put some signage down in those areas to attract people to that area. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of things that they're doing here. Um, you know, they're identifying, you know, just some of these opportunities to leverage the casino. Um, and again, we, we agree that there's, there's a reasonable expectation of an impact on Broadway businesses and that this plan uh, should help improve the visibility and marketing of Broadway uh, to help offset those impacts and, and maybe uh, uh, leverage the presence of the casino as well. So we are recommending this one and uh, I'll open this one up to any comments. Any questions? Everyone's all set, looks like. Thanks. This is, okay. um, we've had the advantage of, of uh, very good briefings from your team, so thank you. Okay, the next one is a joint application of Springfield, West Springfield and Holyoke, a tourism hotel promotion. Um, the communities are asking for $315,000 to fund a tourism hotel promotion called The Funds on Us, uh, designed to encourage overnight hotel stays and boost hotel occupancy in the Springfield area. Um, so what essentially this uh, project would do is uh, do uh, marketing outreach to, uh, they're targeting the New Haven area, the Providence area and the Boston area to try to encourage uh, folks to spend uh, a couple of nights in the Springfield area. And if, uh, if two nights were booked in uh, sort of that Western Mass area around Springfield, um, they would receive $100 visa, visa gift cards um, for those stays. Um, the review team is not recommending uh, this application for funding for a few different reasons. Um, so the first reason really is, is, is you know, identifying the impact of the casino. Uh, the way that this was presented to us in the application was that the development of MGM Springfield um, was expected to bring a lot of overnight business to Western Massachusetts and that um, quite a number of the hotel chains um, built additional hotel capacity in the Springfield area in, in anticipation of this uh, increase in volume. And the impact here saying is that that increase in, in um, visitation uh, didn't really happen. Uh, now, what the, the application submitted us um, a chart that showed uh, occupancy in the area. And 
And what it was showing is that there, that there was not really a significant increase in occupancy after the opening of MGM. But one of the problems that we had with what was submitted was that, that this chart didn't really take into account this increase in hotel rooms. They have presented to us that there was an addition of 862 hotel rooms uh, in the, added in the area between 2013 and 2019. Um, you know, we asked them for some additional information about room stays and things of that nature that might be a little bit more indicative of, of how uh, the population in hotels has changed. And uh, they indicated to us that that information was not available for, for the area. So I guess on the first point, we weren't really convinced um, that there was a significant impact that was associated with MGM that, 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 um, that sort of caused this, this impact. The second piece of it is, um, you know, this category is community planning. And what we were seeing here was really, this didn't really constitute community, a community planning activity. If you look at our guidelines, we, we talk about eligible planning projects must have a defined area or issue that will be investigated, as well as a clear plan for implementation of the results. You know, what we have here is a program that's sort of fully designed. This, this almost seems like a, um, an item that might come out of a planning study, but this isn't really the planning study itself. So in the second piece, we weren't really convinced that this really met the intent of the community planning category. But then the third piece of this, um, uh, you know, Carrie Teresi uh, did some investigations for us on this, and we really have a question as to whether the distribution of gift cards essentially to private entities raises issues under the Massachusetts Constitution's anti-aid amendment. And of course, the anti-aid amendment essentially prohibits expenditures of public funds to private recipients where those expenditures substantially benefit the private entity. So in this case where we would be taking community mitigation funds, purchasing gift cards and giving those directly to private entities, there was some pretty serious concerns that this would uh, run afoul of the anti-aid amendment. Now, while Carrie didn't go into a really in-depth legal analysis of, of all the nuances of this, um, you know, we felt with the first two pieces of this and then with this that it, it just really, uh, we really felt that we couldn't recommend this for uh, to advance. And so with that, I'll open this one up for any questions, which I think I might have a few on. Questions? Hmm. Looks like everyone's more set than you anticipated. I guess. Um, I, I try to read the room, but. Okay, well, if there are no questions on that one, I'll, I'll move on. So that was our last community planning application. And the next three either are uh, specific impact or public safety applications. Um, the first one was the city of Boston, um, and this was a specific impact uh, uh, application. And they were requesting uh, $500,000 to develop a pilot program uh, for community defined and culturally specific activities that will serve as uh, preventive strategies to address problem gambling. Um, so first thing, the city of Boston has actually withdrawn this application, but I would like to spend a few minutes to talk about this, um, th this application. Um, firstly, the review team really was intrigued with this uh, application and uh, Marie Claire um, uh, did a, a review our review for this. And I think we, we all liked the notion, we all agreed that problem gambling and that applications under this, under that would be, you know, eligible for community mitigation funds. But I think when we looked at the application, there really wasn't much in the way of specificity on what kinds of programs were being proposed. It was more of a, a, a very general kind of application. And you know, in these applications, we do require people to have a really specific proposal for us that we're funding. Um, and so when we went back with them with our 
request for supplemental information, asking them really for this specificity, the city indicated to us that they would really need to do an awful lot of work in this area to, to get us that information that, you know, they'd really have to essentially develop, do much further development on the program. And they didn't feel that they would be able to do that in the time frame that we needed in order to approve this. So they did withdraw the application and, but we are really encouraging them, you know, to meet with Mark Vanderlinden and his team, uh, you know, outside of this process. And I think we've actually already got a meeting set up with them to do that, to, to see if we could maybe steer them in a couple of directions. I mean, we're not gonna obviously write an application for them, but, but to say, hey, these are some of the things that, you know, maybe we've been thinking about and can, and just steer them in a direction that, that has a little bit more specificity in it and, and maybe have them bounce some ideas off of us and, and see if, you know, next year we could get a really uh, a good application that could move ahead with this. We don't want to discourage them from doing this, but it was just that the condition that it was in was just probably something that, um, you know, without a, a lot of additional work would be difficult for us to fund. And so I'll open that one up for any questions from the uh, commission. Questions on this? And I know that um, Mark and I don't know if Marie Claire is available today, but um, I do um, agree with your analysis on this, but I do think that there's opportunity in the future in this arena. And Mark, I know that we've, we've spoken about this in the past because <clears throat> community level um, intervention is different from the work that you do through the public health trust funds. Um, and that, they're, that they don't have to be, everything on, on uh, responsible gaming doesn't have to be channeled through the public health trust fund. So, but I think there just seems to be that they may need more guidance on application development and they'll look forward to your training, right, Joe? Might yeah. Is that fair, Mark? Yeah, and I think, you know, and Mark and I are gonna have uh, um, some conversations funny, around this. Mark. I think Mark is trying to speak, but and we're not hearing you, Mark. I'm here. Sorry. I couldn't quite read your lips. Sorry, Joe. I'm sorry. No, I'm quite all right. Thank you. I, I mean, I was just going to, to say, yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that, um, especially working with Joe and, and Mary and Lily, um, kind of talking this through a little bit, it, it seems like it's an exciting area for us to do some work through the Community Mitigation Fund. So um, it's, it sounds great from our end. Excellent, good. Okay, any questions for either Joe or Mark, commissioners on this one? Great, right. thanks. thanks for being right there, Mark. My apologies, okay. Okay, so the next one is the Hamden uh, County Sheriff's Department, uh, their lease assistance. Um, so this is a uh, grant that we've been funding for the last uh, several years. Uh, six, I think, years. This is the, um, So this is dealing with the Western Massachusetts Recovery and Wellness Center. Um, so that the, uh, the Wellness Center was located in the footprint of where MGM Springfield now stands. Uh, and they, they, they needed to move out of that facility. And um, so MGM identified a location for them and, and you know, assisted in the build out of that project and um, you know this is um, a, uh, a facility that is um, requires some you know very specific uh, equipment and so on uh, security and so on so it's not just uh, like this could move any anywhere at all now in the lease that they signed there were some uh, it was significantly more expensive than with what they were at MGM. They were a tenant at will and had been there for 29 years or something to that effect. So they had a, you know, quite a good relationship with the landlord and, and, and it was quite a reasonable cost, but, you know, their costs increased significantly there. Uh, even their rent at the, uh, in downtown Springfield at the uh, MGM site even included their utilities. So, um, 
their rent, not only their rent went up, but their utilities went up and so on. Um, so back in uh, 2016, we agreed to fund this project for five years. Um, so we had uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 were funded uh, with the first uh, tranche of money. We, we put up $2 million, 400,000 a year for the five years. And then after that, um, they asked for an additional five years, but um, it was decided by the commission with the advice of the local community mitigation advisory committees and the subcommittee on community mitigation that, um, you know, no, we shouldn't give them another five years, but they certainly are an eligible entity and we should consider them on a, on a year by year basis. And they, you know, they applied last year and they have applied again this year. We did give them another grant last year. So, you know, Really, nothing has changed in the interim. Uh, you know, they're in the seventh year of their 10 year lease. So, of course, they were at MGM. And, you know, the, the, the siting of MGM caused an impact on them. So, the, that impact, I guess, still exists. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the increase in costs uh, were, were what the impact was. So, you know, the review team is recommending this for funding, but again, um, similar to the discussion, I think that we need to have, we talked about with Northampton, same thing with this. I think the commission, we have, you know, a couple of new commissioners since the uh, last time we voted this, um, that we should probably have that discussion on what is the appropriate role of the community mitigation fund in funding these things on a long-term basis. Is there some point where we say that we have sufficiently mitigated that impact or so not? Joe, actually, before we get into that conversation, because I think my memory and understanding of where they stood with their lease when they were relocated and where they are, what we know now is a little bit different than last year. I mean, we were functioning for a while under the understanding they had had a, a 10 year commitment essentially at the old place that they had to walk away from. So that 10 year umbrella came from this concept that like, well, we would have been able to stay put absent being moved by the casino. Right. But now what I'm hearing is actually they were month to month tenant at will essentially or year to year tenant at will. And now they're being locked into a 10 year lease. So I'm looking for a little clarity on that because that's not the understanding I had the last couple of years we voted on it. And I know I did express wanting more information about their lease and feeling like at a certain point, you know, they need to move on from asking for the money on this. Yeah, what, what had happened was, I think we were under the, the assumption that they that they had a lease on the original property, but I don't think we thought it was a, a 10 year lease. Um, and we did ask them for that. And we were told that, oh, they couldn't find a copy of the old lease. And but right. we did find some earlier documentation from back in 2015 that indicated to us that they were a tenant at will in that property um, rather than under a lease. But I think the point was that they signed into a 10 year lease at this location. So the presumption was, I think at the other location, they had been there for 29 years. There was no expectation that they were gonna be thrown out for any reason, I guess, you know, unless the property got sold right. out from under them. So can I, as a point of clarification, did they give you the document that showed they were the tenants at will or did you find it in prior submissions by them? Yeah, we found that in a prior submission. From okay, so they never um, produced that back to you? No, they, they submitted, but they said it in an earlier submission, right? Yeah. yeah. They did propose that they are tenant at will. Okay. Did they pr produce the lease document that demonstrates they're locked in for a 10-year term? Yeah, we have, we, have that, we have that copy of the new lease, which is what, what? they used to demonstrate the increasing, you know, the increasing cost. Commissioner O'Brien, I'm I'm with you though. I, I I did rely on that. It was a different representation made earlier in the earlier years when I voted on this. So that's why I'm having trouble with it. And I'm just trying to find yeah. out. And maybe that, yeah, maybe the tenant at will was was um uh, that language was in an earlier submission before our time. Right. Mm. And and there's another question, and I think you and I discussed this, Joe, when we talked about this before, which is this, this is also a very different question when there is money available. I mean, so allotting this money does not mean needing necessarily to deny another applicant. 
Correct. Yeah, there, but there, there that, are. Some... If that were in fact the case, um, I, I definitely think I would be taking a different posture. Yeah, I think you know if if there were if there was more competition for the funds and we're saying that, you know, this is competing against something else, we would then have to weigh sort of which one we felt right. was um, more worthy of the funds. But in this case, we, we don't need to do that. Right. And they, I don't know if it's proper to say they're locked into this 10 year lease, like it's an anchor because they got a lot of benefits getting that 10 year lease, right? Because the, MGM paid for the build out, right? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how, I know that the MGM did the build out. I don't know who, who ultimately was paying the cost of it. You know, they did the contracting for them because it was just easier for them to do that. Um, I'd have to go back and, and the bed build out was done just shortly before I started with the commission. And I remember, you know, talking with Brian Packer out there about it, but I, you know, the, the exact details of, who paid for it and how much, I'm, I'm not 100% clear on. Commissioner Skinner, do you have questions, Commissioner Hill? I, I, I'm sorry, Commissioner okay. Skinner, go ahead. Go right ahead, go right ahead. So I had mixed feelings about this one and I have throughout the, the process of sitting down with the team on this. Uh, I'm, I'm having actually issues with some of the applications that are coming through that are more operating and maintenance than they are uh, anything else. And I feel as though this one is operating in maintenance. This is part of the sheriff's budget. And I just feel very strongly that we need to have that um, discussion on the guidelines moving forward on what should be um, looked upon as operating, what's looked upon as construction. Uh, in this particular case, and, and Commissioner O'Brien and um, Chair Judge Stein, you've already brought it up and I was going to bring it up as well. Uh, what was represented early on and what actually is happening now are two very different things. Uh, and I'm not sure if I was on this commission a couple of years ago that if I had the information today that I, that was represented two years ago, I'm not sure that I would have supported it. I don't really want to support this today. But what, what brings me back to supporting it is the uh, $400,000 has been put into their budget for the next fiscal year. And it's probably too late for them to go back to the legislature and actually ask for the funding uh, as the budget's being done as we literally as we're speaking up uh, in the Senate. I, I do think moving forward, Joe, and I don't know how these discussions take place or, or when they'll take place, but I think we need to let them know that this may, may, uh, be the last time, or at the very least, that maybe we're going to start looking at cutting the $400,000 down a little bit as they get uh, closer to the 10 years. That may be something we're willing to do. Um, but this one, I'm a little gun shy on. I, I don't want to really be supporting it today, but I also don't want to be putting the $400,000 in the red uh, because they're depending on this. Um, when that, that discussion probably should have taken place back in December, January, February. Well, and just to be clear also, um, the chair was there as well, but that message of this might be it has gone out to them for several years oh. in a row. Yeah, so because it was originally sort of a five-year commitment, but sort of splayed out annually. And then when I got here, it was pretty much ending and then it was okay. Um, coming before us each year. And I know at least for the last couple of years, we've had the exact conversation that you're talking about. And that, that has been conveyed to them, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and uh, excuse me, Commissioner Hill, I think- Commissioner what... Skinner um, had a comment. I, I oh, wanna... sorry. Oh, well, sorry. I, I think I can be brief given the earlier comments. I agree with Commissioner Hill. Um, the budget issue um, that we might be putting um, the, the Sheriff's Department in is a really good consideration. Um, on the operating and maintenance expense point. I, you know, raised that earlier with Joe in, in the two by two um, and, and, and I'm on the fence. Um, I was on the fence um, before um, Commissioner Hill mentioned the, the budget issue, but I, I really would like us to uh, reconsider. I mean, I, I'm uncomfortable with, with, with telling Northampton no. Um, that we're not going to, you know, grant the award in the future 
uh, relative to their operating and maintenance expenses for their website, but then saying yes to this operating expense for um, Hamden. But I don't think, I think that we clarified in Northampton that they weren't using it for operating expenses. Um, I think that that was clarified. It was for their pro marketing program on the development of their website. If there was some confusion in the past, now it's clear that they yeah. are not using it for operating. And I think the other thing is, is that, you know, under different categories, we have different guidelines. Like for instance, on the public safety, it can be used for uh, operational costs. Yes. Um, under, you know, community planning, you know, these are planning efforts and they're not, you know, uh, sort of day-to-day -day operations. So it is under a different category. The, this is under the specific impact category. And under the specific impact category, we don't, our guidelines are, are are fairly broad saying if you've identified something that's an impact, you can file under the, that doesn't sort of fit under any other category. You can file, you file it under the specific impact category. You explain to us what the impact is. And if we agree that that's an impact and this offsets the cost of that impact, we can approve that. So, right. so there is a, it's a little apples and oranges, but not completely. <laughs> I do recognize the distinction in the category um, but I didn't understand that Northampton had um, uh, relayed that uh, these funds were not being used this time for operating and maintenance of the website. So that's a good clarification. Yeah, if that's right. I, I said it. Is, am I, was that accurate, Joe? Yes. Okay, good. Thank yep. you. Yep. Yeah. So I think that um, I do think uh, what I'm hearing is with respect to specific impact, we we don't have a clarifier whether or not operating costs are allowed. Um, I don't know if this discussion means that that I would be comfortable saying in every instance operating costs aren't permissible, but I do think we really want to think about it, right? Um, right, and, and, I, yeah. and like anything, you know, the, the commission can always waive any particular requirement uh, in the guidelines if if it so chooses. If you know, if someone makes the argument that that something should be included and, you know, that that's doable. But yeah. I think, you know, again, this is really comes down to the broader policy question on, on, on the use of the community mitigation funds. And I think uh, Commissioner Hill, the, the process that we'll go through is probably in, you know, once we're through with this process, like in July, August, we will start teeing up those policy discussions you know, over the course of the year, Mary keeps a running tally of all of these issues. And then we put them into a memo to the commission and have discussions not only with you, but also with the local community mitigation advisory committees, the subcommittee on community mitigation. So we're hearing from the communities, we're hearing from the commission. Ultimately, obviously, the commission is the one who decides what goes into our guidelines. Um, but uh, you I know, came in on the tail end of that last year. So yeah, right, exactly. So so you know, these are look, these questions come up on, on an annual basis uh, as we go through these uh, presentations and always the same kinds of issues come up. So I think um, you know this would be a good opportunity again with, with two new commissioners going through this process, um, you know, different perspectives, you know, we can um, We'll have those discussions and see where they lead us. So where have we left it? With your recommendation? Yes, we are We are still recommending that this be funded for this year. And then I think the follow-up though, because to Commissioner Hill's point, is that if we're concerned about the budgeting process, which I think Commissioner Skinner wants to be really aware of that, fairness factor, we need to be able to message earlier. Yeah, so and, and, and the message really comes out when the guidelines come up. Okay, the guidelines. Because, because okay. We, we literally have dealt with this subject in 2020. We dealt with it in 2021 and we'll be dealing with it again this year. And if the commission decides to keep status quo, then the guidelines come out and, and it's, you know, then, it's eligible if the commission decided that 
that funds were to be cut off, then we would have to make that known in the guidelines. Yeah, I guess I'm, I want to make sure that in forming guidelines, we're not just thinking of one application. You know what I mean? So right. Oh, no. I mean, we need to be... Of that. All right. We so, certainly need to be consistent across, uh, you know, and, and we always make that known when we do our, our outreach is, you know, we go through what changes have been made in the guidelines. And, you know, if, if, if we're saying that, you know, communities can only come in for the same thing so many times or whatever, whatever the, 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 the end result might be, Joe, we will have to be clear about that in our guidelines and in our outreach. Joe, do we know what they asked for for funding? Did they ask for the full vote on their lease for their no. funding for their budget? Or did they go in and only ask for it as if we are going to be matching? Yeah, I, that's a, that's my understanding on how they have how they have budgeted this. So that's, I mean, that's a conundrum too, in terms of why they're not asking for the full amount and, and looking for another source. And, and I agree, I don't want to, you know, and this isn't just the sheriff, this is also sort of a this is their sort of rehab. You know, there's a there's a a broader social impact to not giving them the money. Um, but that's troubling to me that there's almost a presumption that, that they're not going to another source to say, this is it. And I don't have a guarantee. And so I don't know what, if any understanding the legislature may be having in terms of assuming we're just going to keep funding at least for the next couple of years. Right. It, Cause it assumes always that we would have, you know, sufficient have the money and, and vote to give it to right. them. Exactly. So and we've met the last several years. That's not exactly where we stand. And yet they're still not asking for the full funding. That's, I'd hate to see that be a, a calculated risk that they take and, and services are not available because of that choice. So what do you think? Total amount of money or bring in? Or I, I would think maybe the link to this meeting uh, in the follow-up in terms of if this is going to be voted to be awarded this year, they, I would have hoped that they listened to us in years past, but I'm thinking that that point in particular um, maybe needs to be conveyed to the applicant. Commissioner Skinner, what do you think? What's the total amount of their rent annually? Is it is it it's it's greater than the four hundred thousand? I understand. oh yeah, it, I I don't have the uh, I don't have the lease in front of me, no. but it's Lily or Mary. I, I don't know if you know. I I don't have it on me. Yeah. Um, no, this is just a, a, a small significant portion. We have in the past asked them to, and we never really got a good clear answer as to why they have not incorporated this as part of their budget through the legislature. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, there is a, this is just covering some of it. Nikisha, and I, I'm not hearing why there's a particular logic to what portion or anything like that. Well, they did, this was the Delta. You this know, I mean, it's actually right. smaller than the Delta. What they pay and what they would have paid if they stay put, right? The right. Delta. So, so it was the Delta on the rent. But in addition to that, they're also paying utilities that they didn't pay for before. So we're not making up the whole shortfall, but it's a piece of the shortfall. The Delta of the, right. the rent. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I'm so, is this information required as part of the application process? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we have the copy of the of the lease. I just I just don't have it in front of me. Got it. Yeah, but I think uh, to your point, like how much what the balance is, it's not because I was thinking, oh, I wonder how they choose, but I forgot that it's the delta of what they were paying. So the the um the, the specific impact of their their um their move was the increase in rent. Yep. That was four hundred thousand. Okay. I do have it up in front of me. Thanks. So and <laughs> sorry, it was just slow driving. Um, mm -hmm. So it looks like, can I share this? Yeah. Sorry. My computer is not moving. Uh, okay. So this is what we received from them. So there, it's quite a bit different than the, just the 400,000. Can you ink, uh, make that a little bit bigger, please, Lily? If you... Yes, it, it did not scan it very well. That's okay, it's getting clearer. So this is, this is what they sent. So it's over a million. 
It's about 1.1, Lily, is that what that says? Yeah, that's what I think it looks like. Oh, this isn't sensitive information that we're sharing. Um, no, it's a uh, this is their public. this is their decam. Yeah. yeah, public. Yeah. So this is what they provided us with their monthly expenditure. So the four hundred thousand is not the whole. So is it one million plus four hundred or one million minus four hundred? No, that's what their lease. No, that's, that's their, their lease, lease payment. Is. This and is their lease. Yeah. Four hundred of it. So, so we're, they were we're paying almost a third. Or yeah, so what? they were paying six hundred, and now they're paying one month. So they we're taking care of that delta. Yeah, that, I think about it. And you can see there are some increases over the over the life of the the uh, lease. Not that you can see them well. I was going to say, <laughs> if you see them, well, not gonna, the best scan document I've ever seen. And then it's being and then through our process, but it's really helpful to see it, Lily. Thank you for bringing it up. And what year of the ten years are we are they in now? They're in year se they're in year seven. seven. So this would be eight. No, this is this no, year seven. Okay. So at best, if we continued to fund as we have been, they we'd be on the hook for an another three years. Through well, you know, years. I mean this. This again, it just begs the policy question. We could be on the, you know, I mean, if we agreed to fund it, we could fund it beyond 10 years or or or, or not. I mean, it's it's not, it's it's completely within the purview of the commission on what you want that to be. This again, this is why it's a policy question on right. you know when when is enough enough. Well, Joe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I feel like the first time I saw this after the five ran out, did they ask for five again? Yeah. And we said no. Come and in each year. It was the same conversation we're all talking about, but you can come back each year. Yep. Uh, but I feel like our, our questions are being a little more pointed. And I, I don't know that, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but a, a level of frustration maybe with the lack of specificity in terms of efforts they've made to not come back and ask for it. Yes. Understood. Okay, are we ready to move on to the next one? I think so. I think for right today and what's in front of us today, we're good, right, commissioners? But I think we have some things to think about. All right, thanks. So the, the next one is our last one, which is Saugus. Um, this is for some solar lighting on the Northern Strand Community Trail. Um, just uh, by way of background. So they're asking for $187,000 under the public safety category to add um, solar lights to the Northern Strand uh, Trail. So just as a little background, uh, the Northern Strand had been constructed from Everett up into, into um, Medford. And then a couple of years ago, um, the state extended it all the way up to Lynn. So before that, it had just been a, an old rail trail that was just dirt. Now it's paved all the way up into Lynn. And um, so Saugus so would like to add some solar lights to this so it would be more usable in the evenings. Um, now, this, what's interesting about this one is when we introduced the public safety category, which first was a subset of specific impact and, and is now a standalone category, um, I think at least internally, we had envisioned this as being for public safety, being for public safety agencies, being uh, things like police, fire, um, EMS, DA's office, things of that nature. Um, I guess we didn't really think about it in terms of constructing something that provided some safety. Um, so when this application came in, we, we first kind of looked at this and said, gee, this feels more like a transportation construction project than it does a public safety project. Um, so we did ask the community, um, you know, why they chose to do this as a public safety application. And, and they responded back to us. I thought it was, it was a very good response that the community had, which was that really what kind of precipitated this was after the Northern Strand was built, there was a, a quite a bit of outreach to the, the um, Saugus uh, public safety group to the police department um, 
asking what they can do to improve safety on the bike path at night so that they could use it in extended hours. Um, so really that was kind of the driver for this. Um, and so, um, you know, they had responded to us that, that there was, you know, definitely interest in providing a safer nighttime environment on the trail. Um, and they also noted a study that was done uh, by New York City back in 2018 that found that crime was reduced by 39% by the addition of lighting to public use spaces. Um, and, you know, and we see this as really an opportunity, you know, in the summertime when it's light until 8.30 at night, there's maybe not as much of an issue, but on those sort of shoulder seasons in the fall and the spring, when it's still getting dark early, this would provide an opportunity for people who are uh, coming from or going to the casino to, to maybe use this, you know, thinking more in the terms of employees, um, you know, later into the evenings and where they would feel safer. So I guess, um, you know, when we looked at it as a review team, you know, we certainly felt that um, you certainly could look at this as a public safety project. And again, I think this comes down to our uh, guidelines for next year um, that I think we want to tighten up our guidelines to reflect, um, you know, a better, you know, just where we want things to fall. And that doesn't mean that we don't want this type of project to fall into public safety. It's really up to the commission to decide whether we maybe want to expand public safety to include these types of things, or do we want to tighten it up and make sure that these get included in other categories. So again, a topic for discussion, I think for another day, but basically the review team came down on that saying, yeah, we think, um, you know, you probably could consider this in either category, but it's not unreasonable to uh, consider it as a public safety grant um, as it is uh, improving the safety of travel on the Northern Strand. Um, and, you know, as far as the, the um, you know, the use, you know, we're, we're fine with, with the use of this. We did one like this for Everett last year. Um, on the Northern Strand, um, they did come in under the pub, under the transportation construction category, but um, you know, so uh, again, we're, we're I guess we're fine with this one as it is, um, but we definitely want to look at our guidelines for next year to make sure we're being uh, abundantly clear on on what category things should fall. And with that, I will open that one up for questions. Before we decide to expand on public safety has what that means, you know, that's the, um, I could see why they would want to put this under public safety, quite frankly, so. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's, there's definitely that. It's just mm -hmm. that we didn't have anything in our guidelines that was really clear that this should go one place or the other, which is why we're considering it in the category in which yeah. we submit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, bike trails and lights. Commissioners, questions? Very consistent with our work in the past, right, commissioners? Yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Joe. Anything else? That is it for today. That is it for today. Stay tuned for round five and six in June. Uh, and and thank you to Lily and, and Mary. Um, commissioners, uh, if you don't have any further questions or as a team here, I know that we have um, approvals to be made. Is there someone who would um, first up? Are there any questions before we go to that? Okay. Do I have a motion then? I certainly will attempt to do a motion, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I uh, move that the commission approve the applications uh, from the following applicants for funding from the Community Mitigation Fund for the purposes described in the submitted applications and materials included in the commissioner's packet and for the reasons described therein and discussed here today. They are as follow, the city of Everett, $100,000, town of Foxborough, Plainville and Rentham, $136,000, the city of Malden, $100,000 upon submission of satisfactory evidence to the chief of community affairs that it has appropriate ownership or control of the subject property. The city of Medford, $100,000. Town of Northampton, $75,000 on the condition that the city develop 
develop and provide to the commission a written plan that outlines the specific steps that it will take to transition the subject website into a self-sustaining platform. This plan shall be submitted with the first quarterly report to be submitted by October 1st, 2022. To the City of Revere, $100,000. To the Hamden County Sheriff's Department, $400,000 and to the city of Saugus, $187,000. And further, that the commission staff be authorized to execute a grant instrument commemorating this award in accordance with 205 CMR 153.04. Second. Any discussion? Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, thank you. And now with respect to, there's one outstanding um, application, I believe. I have a motion. Do we not have to move formally? No, we do. Yes. Okay. I'm happy to make that motion. Uh, thank you. Chair. Thank you. I move that the commission deny the application for funding from the Community Mitigation Fund for safety improvements collectively submitted by the cities of Springfield, West Springfield, and Holyoke for the reasons described in the memorandum in the commissioner's packet and discussed here today. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion on that? Okay, Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. And Commissioner Skinner? Aye. And I vote yes, four to zero. I, I did vote last time, correct? Thank you. Um, all right. Um, with that, I believe, Chief Delaney, you've completed your your community affairs work today. Am I right? Uh, not quite. We still have Plain Ridge Park Casino to do, but- um... Oh, that's right. My apologies. And of course they are ready to go next. So um, we're now, um, they, they needed to, go between 12.30 and 1.45, uh, they could start. So I suspect Lisa is prepared. Um, so this is now- We item, are prepared. There we are. This is item uh, 5C on our, on our agenda. And then we're gonna be able to resume the, um, the uh, agenda in order. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for your patience. Absolutely. <clears throat> Good afternoon. If you're ready for us to present, then I'll share my screen and we can get ready to go. Um, let's see. Okay. Share screen. And assuming you can all see that, I think yep. we should be ready to go. We can see it. That's fun. All right, fantastic. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Plain Ridge Park is pleased to present our Q1 2022 report. I'm joined this afternoon by Kathy Lucas, our Vice President of Human Resources, and Heidi Yates Akbaba, our new Vice President of Finance. Um, I will present the slides on compliance, but right now I'm going to hand it over to Heidi, who will cover the slides on the financials, and I will take over for her when we get on the section of compliance. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you. All right. Uh, you can see that uh, Q1 2022 was very similar to Q4, Q4 2021 for us. Both had slot revenues of 33.7 million, state tax at 13.4 versus 13.5. Race tax was 3 million in both quarters, and total taxes were 16.5. So a smooth transition into 2022 for us. Next slide. Lottery sales continue to perform well for us by outperforming Q1 of 2021 by 49,000 or up 10.7% uh, year over year. We continue our marketing promotion efforts to support lottery sales. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, Q1 total uh, qualified spend from Massachusetts, it's up 200,000 over Q4 of 2021, which was $412,000. Operational spend is what drove uh, this increased uh, spend for Plain Ridge. The qualified spend outside of Massachusetts was driven by the purchase of an IT server equipment uh, and cash recycling machines, which were from specialized vendors in Illinois. Next slide. Uh, Q1 local spend with our closest neighboring communities was 76,901, leaving 87% of that 612,000 or 536,000 in Massachusetts communities that were outside of our local region. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about uh, vendor diversity. We were able to exceed our overall goal of 21% primarily by surpassing our minority spend. This was driven by purchases of Tito tickets, some IT equipment, general printing and maintenance supplies from minority owned businesses. The, WE, the WBE spend was slightly below target at 11.78%. The percentage on this slide does round up. So uh, we did fall a little short of our Q1 um, goal and VBE spend as well. But we have no concerns about meeting our overall annual goal in that area. Next slide. Okay, so putting some uh, dollar figures to the previous slide, you can see that uh, WBE spend was down 22,000 to Q4. There were some capital projects uh, that were um, benefited in Q4 by our women-owned businesses that did not repeat in Q1. The MBE uh, spend increase related to the aforementioned goods uh, that we were uh, mentioned in the previous slide. And you can see the 4K delta in the VBE spend to Q4, and that was largely driven by equipment and apparel purchases that also did not repeat in Q1. Okay. Great. So, and on the compliance side in first quarter, we prevented a total of 169 patrons from entering the gaming establishment. Seven of those patrons were minors, 23 were under age, 139 had expired, invalid, or no credentials. There were two instances of underage patrons accessing the casino floor, and there were two instances in which an underage patron gambled. Good Thank you, North. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, we'll look at the information on our employment slides. These employees referenced were current as of Q1. In 2022, we had 325 team members. We continue to exceed our diversity goal of 15% in Q1, with 24% of our team members being diverse. As well, we exceeded our veterans goal of 2% maintaining 6% from uh, Q4. And then we exceeded our, well, in Q1, we achieved 42% of our women team members goal of 50%, which is a little bit of an uptick from um, our last couple of quarters, um, but it's still held back because our casual restaurant and banquet departments haven't reopened. In Q1, our local team members were 34%, close to our, local goal. Um, the areas that are included in this count are Attleboro, Foxboro, Mansfield, North Attleboro, Plainville, and Rentham. And you can also see on the slide that we had 70% of our team members full-time and 30% part-time. We did not have any seasonals because racing didn't open until Q2. Next slide, North. But before you move on, actually, can I ask about the women's stat? Um, I know you said that um, you seem to be attributing the eight percentage delta to primarily the, the restaurants that haven't opened yet. Right. So Flutie's, which is our casual dining restaurant, usually we have anywhere from 13 to 20 servers that are usually on the female um, side heavy. Um, we do have male stem servers, but it's usually more female oriented. So that's about, you know, anywhere from 13 to 18 persons there. And then with management, it's usually that 60-40 um, split higher on the female side for managers in the casual dining. And then similar to banquets, we're 
you know, with our, our banquet servers. So we, we do have event bartenders that we brought back, but we did, haven't brought back banquet servers yet or a banquet manager. And what's the projection on that in terms of bringing that stuff back online? So I'm gonna to defer to North. Yeah, so I think with, with this department, it's certainly our desire to get it open. With Banquet, we are slowly reopening that. Um, we're starting to get requests for events. So those things are coming in. And as we do, uh, we're taking those things. Those things realistically are about three to four months out right now um, is kind of the, the schedule of what we're seeing. And those requests are kind of starting to pick up a little bit. With regards to the food outlet, um, again, that's one where our biggest impediment to being able to reopen that outlet right now is culinary staffing. Um, like most of the rest of the restaurant industry, um, getting cooks um, is, is the hard part. Front of house staff is less difficult for, for us to come by at this point. We continue recruiting. Um, we do have some uh, additional outlets that will be opening this summer, primarily on the patio. Um, but it, it is our intention to open that outlet. So is it really a staffing issue that's holding up the reopening? It is. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Right, so in this slide, it speaks to our supervisors in above and you'll see 26% of our supervisors identify as diverse, 5% are veterans and 31% are women. Next slide, North. So just wanted to share some information in regards to what we're doing around uh, our community initiatives and diversity and inclusion. In Q1, we were able to support two organizations that align with our commitment to local diversity and women's organizations with Tito Box donations. The first being the Boston Pearl Foundation, which advances and supports education by providing underserved students with the financial assistance needed to attend college. Specifically, their focus is on furthering the education of young black women who enroll in a fresh, who enroll as freshmen in a four-year college or university. And then New Hope, which ends domestic and sexual violence by engaging survivors, stakeholders, and communities to build an anti-violence movement. They seek to create communities free from violence where individuals and families are able to achieve their full potential. We were also able to make donations to the American Cancer Society, um, under the Making Strides Breast Cancer and the Real Men Wear Pink campaign. And then to the Friends of North Attleboro veterans who we partner with in the past for their local holiday event. Next slide, North. And you've all met Heidi today. Um, exciting news is that Heidi joined us as our VP of Finance, increasing the level of talent and experience on our executive team tremendously. Some other notable mentions, um, we did go back to Johnson and Wales University for more talent. We did pick up some interns that will start with us this summer. And thanks to your presence at the 2022 racing opening day, we were able to celebrate Steve and Dom's milestone anniversaries in a monumental way. North also hosted our town hall meeting, sharing the 2022 goals and our 2021 successes with the team. And then we also celebrated Women's History Month and had our first local community sip and sell, giving local entrepreneurs, primarily women, the opportunity to showcase their items for sales. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I'll try questions. To Commissioners, I'm sorry. I, Maybe I have uh, a question on regarding the the banquet in the restaurant opening north. Can you just maybe touch upon where you've reached out for these culinary uh, jobs? Because we've been um, in the community, we just dealt with the community mitigation uh, funds. And I know in the past, we've given grants out um, to local community colleges to try and feed that world, you know, not, no pun intended, to, uh, to feed that industry to try and get some help for the casinos and surrounding restaurants in Boston and out more importantly on the western part of the state. Can you just kind of touch upon how have you reached out to community colleges? Have you reached out to like a Bridgewater 
I'm just trying to think off the top of my my head where these kids or prospective employees might be. Right. So um, we in this area, there are a lot of local technical schools that are primarily with high school aged kids, which is a little bit of a challenge for us. Um, the other, but we have found some success working with the United Regional Chamber of Commerce. Um, they've been able to provide some good resources for us. We've had some success um, working through the United, United Regional as they have a business, for example, that may know um, a restaurant, for example, that's shutting down. Um, they sometimes have a heads up on those types of um, instances and we're able to go to those businesses and say, hey, you know, it's unfortunate that you're, you know, closing, but we do have jobs available. Um, so we are, we're making some inroads that way. We have different other online recruiting um, platforms that we're using like I Hire Chefs. Obviously we use Indeed, a couple of the other online recruiting um, platforms. With regards to local community colleges, I, I think that that's probably one that's worth us going into a little bit more. Um, obviously not within the Commonwealth, but Johnson and Wales has been a good source for us of culinary talent, both for folks who are looking for internships as well as folks who are looking for full-time jobs um, to, to work or to work at least part-time while they're going to school. But we can certainly reach uh, Bridgewater State. I can tell you only uh, what I've experienced on the North Shore where we have a lot of uh, technical schools as well. And they now are partnering with our community colleges so that they can get right into a college, get the, um, exp uh, get the, uh, education they need and they get right into jobs within two years. So my hope would be that that's what's happening over with your vocational schools, but it's been very successful here on the North Shore. Brad, can I just address that also? Yes. So, so um, through the Tri-Cities Chamber, we have um, also partnered with um, a couple of the folks that are at the community colleges to share our job postings and actually get myself and Colin um, the opportunities to speak um, locally. So you're, you're exactly right in regards to um, having that relationship. Um, we're, we're, we're pounding the pavement. I think one of the things that we're, we're finding is, is that um, there, there are a lot of opportunities right now in that world. And so we're, we're working not only with recruitment, but with our benefits and, and also um, with competitive salaries to, to be an employer of choice for, for those students that are coming out of, out of um, college too. And sure. I think we can share that. I think, I think what I'm hearing or at least seeing is a lot of uh, venues. And again, I, I can only speak for the North Shore at this point, because that's what I see and that's where I live is you know a lot of the banquets and a lot of the restaurants are now starting to open again and they're starting to book weddings again and i just hope that that will happen in your facility as well out in your neck of the woods so brad i'll also just share we um had a conversation with um our director of food and beverage damien um literally three days ago and um, we're stepping into the arena. He's entertaining uh, breakfast meetings. Uh, the control of putting out a breakfast meeting or a brunch meeting is a, a, a little bit more feasible than, than doing potentially a wedding with like um, five courses. So he's, he's fully engaged as North said, so that we can um, actually, we actually have those jobs posted now. So um, hopefully in Q2, we'll be able to, to share some successes. Thank you, and I'm sorry to take up your time on that. No sorries for the discussion. Other questions? Um, if you want uh, to take down the, the program, we can all see each other. Um, but we are seeing each other right here. It's a little uncomfortable, quite frankly, all right. <laughs> as I look at our picture. <laughs> um, so, um, Commissioners, excellent presentation from VPC. Do you have any follow-up questions now? No. Well, let's be um, hopeful, uh, Kathy, with all your efforts that uh, Flutie gets going because we know it's center stage 
um, at your property, and we we hope that that can get engaged. It's an important amenity. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Any any questions in terms of being there for the um, opening day? I think there's some races too that we'll want to get on our calendar. Um, so we'll coordinate with Dr. Lightbound about those uh, races coming up. We always love to be part of the excitement, but we also just uh, on a day-to-day -day basis appreciate um, the continuing work that you do with that, that um, uh, part of your, your program as well. Uh, we, we didn't get an update on Derby Day, although we were quite informed uh, going into it because you were going to use um, the, the drive-through um, element, but I understand the weather didn't cooperate for you. Weather was not was not great that day, Madam Chair. Um, it was a little cold and windy, um, but there were a lot of folks inside. Uh, the property looked great. A lot of people had a good time that day, um, and you know we look forward to Derby Day next year. Yeah, and we'll it was a big race. It was. It was. It was. Uh, if you didn't get the the chance to watch it, it was a fantastic uh, race to watch. It was an amazing race to watch. Yeah, but did you end up um, executing the drive-through because of the wind? Did you keep it inside, all, all that inside? We did for a limited time. Oh, okay. um, uh, it, it did end up getting pretty windy um, that day and made it a little bit difficult to execute. Um, okay. So we did pull back, but yeah, we but you appreciate did, it. Um, but you were able to use it a little bit. Okay, Yes, great. and it's on our calendar next year to make sure that we get a request in early if it's something that we would like to do. I love to know those details. Thank you, Nora. Yes. Um, and and I, I think my fellow commissioners uh, shared that. So it was really helpful. And again, we thank the team for sort of the last minute pulling it together, Lisa, to inform, keep us informed. So thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Thank you, uh, North and team. We appreciate it. Um, and I guess, Heidi, I, I feel like this was our, our first virtual meeting, right? I, I think I just got word of your um, your appointment through perhaps our IEB director. And uh, so congratulations and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, commissioners. Okay, then um, Joe, unless there's something else, we're- That completes my work for today. Thank you Please so much. Thank you. All right, and um, thank you again to North. Then we're gonna move right into, um, because I think we only have a couple of short items rather than break, if you could just bear with me. Um, we'll go right into the legal division and we've got Carrie on board for the new regulation. Yes, good okay. afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so you have one draft regulation in your packet. It is 205 CMR 116.03. Um, this is part of the larger 205 CMR 116, which relates to persons required to be licensed or qualified by the commission. Uh, and 116.03 specifically gives the commission authority to grant waivers from qualification requirements for certain individuals. Um, so we just have one small change related to institutional investors, and this was flagged by the IEB as part of the reg review process. Um, I'm just going to share uh, the red line with you just so you can see um, just the small change we're talking about here. Can everyone see that? Okay. Um, so you'll see here in, in section B, just this one small change. Um, 23K section 14 reads that the commission may waive the licensing requirements for institutional investors holding up to 15% of the stock of the applicant company, et cetera. Um, and the existing reg, as you can see, reads that the commission may waive the qualification requirements for institutional investors uh, if they hold less than 15% of the stock. Um, so we're just updating the reg here to bring it in line with the statute, of course, up to would include 15% and less than would not include the 15%. Um, so just a small change here to make the regulation consistent with the statute. Um, so happy to answer any questions that you might have. And if not, we'd just be looking for a vote to um, begin the promulga promulgation process on this one. Commissioners, questions from Terry? Good catch on the reg review. There we go, right? Um, excellent. Very good. So, yeah, um, so IEB that... Um, uh, 
it's a simple, straightforward amendment, but an important one. So thank you. All right, do I have a motion for Carrie? I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement and amendment to 205 CMR 116.03 as outlined in the commissioner's packet and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the promulgation process. Second. Thank you. Um, any further questions? All right, Commissioner Bryan. Aye. Um, Commissioner Hill. Aye. And Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Thank you, and I vote yes. So, for Thank you. Mary, you get the process underway. Thank you. And now on our last matter of the day, um, we have an update on um, legislative update, uh, Crystal Boschman and Commissioner Hill and um, Todd Grossman, General Counsel, and anybody else who wants to join in on the subject matter. Crystal? Hello, I'm just a really, Quick update, just a few items, all of which you can also find in the memo I attached to the packet. Um, for sports betting, I think we're all aware, but the Senate did pass their version of the bill on May 4th. A few notable differences there from the House bill, uh, primarily the restriction on collegiate sports, um, much higher tax rate, and some language uh, on credit card use and uh, gambling advertising. Additionally, we, it, we saw that that bill pulled the licenses for veterans organizations out of uh, their amended final version. Um, uh, the similarities were some, including the occupational licenses, temporary licensure, which um, we had been looking for in other versions of bills in the past uh, includes some of our reporting requirements, funding, similarities, um, and some language regarding MBE, WBE, and ZBE enterprises. I don't think I'll actually turn that over quickly to Commissioner Hill, but I don't think we had anything we've seen in the last few days that has changed from our, la our recent update, correct? That's accurate. Okay, um, just making sure. Yeah, we provided this this memo early. <laughs> so there has been a conference committee put together, uh, consisting of representatives Aracella, Nicolets, Meridian, and for the Senate, um, we uh, have uh, Rodriguez, Eric Lesser, and Senator O'Connor as well. Um, that conference committee will collaborate to report to us a final bill. Uh, we don't have a date on them. Uh, for the budget, we had a very small, um, just an update to our appropriations. Uh, there's a little bit of an explanation in your memo from uh, CFO Lennon. Thankfully, he, he had his eye on this anyway. And this is related, the brief change is related to the local aid payments um, and the racetracks. So this assists moving forward. In the past, we haven't been able to provide full payment to the cities and towns. The amendment to the budget remedies that. Uh, and in my last update, we just noted that there were a couple racing bills we have our eyes on. Nothing has happened related to those bills. We do still currently monitor them as they would have impacts for our racing division. Um, we should probably hear something on those shortly. And then of course, we have also been watching what happens with the open meeting law, allowing our remote meetings. And uh, as you guys know, because you um, took in this and voted on it in the last meeting, uh, we have submitted a letter to the legislature um, expressing our interest in being able to continue remote access beyond the deadline of July 15th. So that's all I had for you guys today. Um, if you have any questions, please let me, Commissioner Hill or Todd, know. Questions, questions at this stage? All right. Are you sure you have no questions, Commissioner Hill? <laughs> I think no um, questions. <laughs> he's a key player here. 
We want to probably think about putting together a letter um, addressing the horse racing deadline. Yes, so uh, we have had a brief internal conversation um, with Alex as well as Todd, and we will be meeting shortly to review the letter and, and look to see what changes we should need on that by Commissioner Hill. And we have planned to do that before the end of June. Is it, I think, we, I think we'll be bringing it, deadline, right? July and we'll be bringing it in front of you guys as well so that you can uh, vote on that. I believe we're aiming for the June 22nd. Okay, great. And um, I think we, Todd, we've done one in the past. It will probably follow very closely to what we've done. I think we can view that as a helpful reminder. Really, I think they'll appreciate that, right, Commissioner Hill? Um, okay, so that would just be on our radar for one of our, our June meetings. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Any, any further comments or questions? All right, well, thank you. And it's very helpful to have it in writing. A very helpful memo, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Okay, any further updates from our commissioners? After a long day yesterday, I thought we would probably appreciate finishing before 1.30 and lunch. So um, <clears throat> again, I appreciate all the work uh, <clears throat> that we did yesterday. And uh, thank you. And I think we have a, a meeting tomorrow um, that will be following up on yesterday's uh, suitability work. So thank you. Um, so with that, I need a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'll start everyone. Oh, nothing further? Okay. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.